Chapter 21 Dr. Seward's Diary 3rd of October Let me put down with exactness all that happened, as well as I can remember, since last I made an entry. Not a detail that I can recall must be forgotten. In all calmness I must proceed. When I came to Renfield's room, I found him lying on the floor on his left side in a glittering pool of blood. When I went to move him, it became at once apparent that he had received some terrible injuries. There seemed none of the unity of purpose between the parts of the body which marks even lethargic sanity. As the face was exposed, I could see that it was horribly bruised, as though it had been beaten against the floor. Indeed, it was from the face wounds that the pool of blood originated. The attendant who was kneeling beside the body said to me as we turned him over, I think, sir, his back's broken. See, both his right arm and leg and the whole side of his face are paralysed. How such a thing could have happened puzzled the attendant beyond measure. He seemed quite bewildered and his brows were gathered in as he said, I can't understand the two things. He could mark his face like that by beating his own head against the floor. I, I saw a young woman do it once at Eversfield Asylum before anyone could lay hands on her. And I suppose he might have broken his neck by falling out of bed if he got in an awkward kink. But for the life of me, I can't imagine how the two things occurred. If his back was broke, he couldn't beat his head. And if his face was like that before the fall out of bed, there would be marks of it. I said to him, Go to Dr. Van Helsing and ask him to kindly come here at once. I want him here without an instant's delay. The man ran off, and within a few minutes the professor in his dressing gown and slippers appeared. When he saw Renfield on the ground, he looked keenly at him a moment, and then turned to me. I think he recognised the thought in my eyes, for he said, very quietly, manifestly for the ears of the attendant, Ah, a sad accident. He will need very careful watching and uh, much attention. I shall uh, stay with you myself, but I shall first address myself. If you will remain, I shall in a few minutes join you. The patient was now breathing stertorously, and it was easy to see he had suffered some terrible injury. Van Helsing returned with extraordinary celerity, bearing with him a surgical case. He had evidently been thinking, and had his mind made up, for almost before he looked at the patient, he whispered to me, Send the attendant away. Send the attendant away. We must be alone with him when he becomes conscious, after the operation. I said, I, I, I think that'll do now, Simmons. We've done all that we can at present. You had better go on your round, and Dr. Van Helsing will operate. Let me know instantly if there's anything unusual anywhere. The man withdrew, and we went into a strict examination of the patient. The wounds of the face were superficial. The real injury was a depressed fracture of the skull, extending right up through the motor area. The professor thought a moment and said, We must reduce the pressure and get back to normal conditions as far as can be, the rapidity of the suffusion shows the terrible nature of his injury. The whole motor area seems affected. The suffusion of the brain will increase quickly, so we must trepan at once, or it may be too late. As he was speaking, there was a soft tapping at the door. I went over and opened it and found in the corridor without Arthur and Quincy in pyjamas and slippers. The former spoke. I, I heard your man call up Dr. Van Helsing and tell him of an accident, so I woke Quincy, or, or rather called for him as he was not asleep. Things are moving too quickly and too strangely for sound sleep for any of us these times. I've been thinking that tomorrow night we'll not see things as they have been. We'll have to look back and forward a little more than we have done. May we come in? I nodded and held the door open till they had entered. Then I closed it again. When Quincy saw the attitude and state of the patient and noted the horrible pool on the floor, he said softly, My God, what has happened to him? Poor, poor devil. I told him briefly and added that we expected he would recover consciousness after the operation, 
for a short time at all events. He went at once and sat down on the edge of the bed with Godalming beside him. We all watched in patience. We shall wait, said Van Helsing, just long enough to fix the best spot for trepanning, so that we may most quickly and perfectly remove the blood clot, for it is evident that the hemorrhage is increasing. The minutes during which we waited passed with fearful slowness. I had a horrible sinking in my heart, and from Van Helsing's face I gathered that he felt some fear or apprehension as to what was to come. I dreaded the words Renfield might speak. I was positively afraid to think, but the conviction of what was coming was on me, as I have read of men who have heard the death watch. The poor man's breathing came in uncertain gasps. Each instant he seemed as though he would open his eyes and speak, but then would follow a prolonged stertorous breath, and he would relapse into a more fixed insensibility. Inured as I was to sick beds and death, this suspense grew and grew upon me. I could almost hear the beating of my own heart, and the blood surging through my temples sounded like blows from a hammer. The silence finally became agonizing. I looked at my companions, one after another, and saw from their flushed faces and damp brows that they were enduring equal torture. There was a nervous suspense over us all, as though overhead some dread bell would peal out powerfully when we should least expect it. At last there came a time when it was evident that the patient was sinking fast. He might die at any moment. I looked up at the professor and caught his eyes fixed on mine. His face was sternly set as he spoke. There is no time to lose. His words may be worth many lives. I have been thinking so as I stood here. It may be there is a soul at stake. We shall operate just above the ear. Without another word he made the operation. For a few moments the breathing continued to be stertorous. Then there came a breath so prolonged that it seemed it would tear open his chest. Suddenly his eyes opened and became fixed in a wild, helpless stare. This was continued for a few moments, then it was softened into a glad surprise, and from his lips came a sigh of relief. He moved convulsively, and as he did so said, I'll be quiet, doctor. Tell them to take off the straight waistcoat. I have had a terrible dream, and it has left me so weak that I cannot move. What's wrong with my face? It feels all swollen. And it smarts dreadfully. He tried to turn his head, but even with the effort his eyes seemed to grow glassy again, so I gently put it back. Then Van Helsing said in a quiet, grave tone, Tell us your dream, Mr. Enfield. As he heard the voice, his face brightened through its mutilation, and he said, that is Dr. Van Helsing. How good it is of you to be here. Give me some water. My, my lips are dry, and I shall try to tell you. I, I dreamed. He stopped and seemed fainting. I called quietly to Quincy. The brandy, it's in my study. Quick. He flew and returned with a glass, the decanter of brandy and a carafe of water. We moistened the parched lips, and the patient quickly revived. It seemed, however, that his poor injured brain had been working in the interval, for when he was quite conscious, he looked at me piercingly with an agonized confusion, which I shall never forget, and said, I, I must not deceive myself. It was no dream, but all a, a grim reality. Then his eyes roved around the room. As they caught sight of the two figures sitting patiently on the edge of the bed, he went on, if I were not sure already, I would know from them. For an instant, his eyes closed, not with pain or sleep, but voluntarily, as though he were bringing all his faculties to bear. When he opened them, he said hurriedly and with more energy than he had yet displayed, Qu Quick, quick, doctor, I'm dying. I feel that I have but a few minutes, and then I must go back to death, or worse. Wet my lips with brandy again. 
I have something that I must say before I die, or before my poor crushed brain dies, anyhow. Thank you. It was that night, after you left me, when I implored you to, to let me go away. I couldn't speak then, for I felt my tongue was tied. But I was as sane then, except in that way, as I am now. I, I was in an agony of despair for a long time after you left me. It seemed hours. Then there came a sudden peace to me. My brain seemed to become cool again, and I realised where I was. I, I heard the dogs bark behind our house, but not where he was. As he spoke, Van Helsing's eyes never blinked. But his hand came out and met mine and gripped it hard. He did not, however, betray himself. He nodded slightly and said, Go on, in a low voice. Renfield proceeded. He came up to the window in the mist, as I had seen him often before. But he was solid then, not a ghost. And his eyes were fierce like a man's when angry. He was laughing with his red mouth, and the sharp white teeth glinted in the moonlight when he turned to look back over the belt of trees to where the dogs were barking. I wouldn't ask him to come in at first, though I knew he wanted to, just as he had wanted to all along. Then he began promising me things, not in words, but by doing them. He was interrupted by a word from the professor. How? By making them happen, just as he used to send in the flies when the sun was shining. Great big fat ones with steel and sapphire on the wings and big moths in the night with skull and crossbones on their backs. Van Helsing nodded to him as he whispered to me unconsciously, The Acherontia Atropos of the Sphinges of what you call the Death's Head Moth. The patient went on without stopping. Then he began to whisper, Rats, 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 hundreds, thousands, millions of them, and every one alive. And dogs to eat them. And cats too. All lives, all red blood, with years of life in it, and not merely buzzing flies. I laughed at him, for I wanted to see what he could do. Then the dogs howled away beyond the dark trees in his house. He beckoned me to the window, I got up and looked out, and he raised his hands and seemed to call out without using any words. A dark mass spread over the grass, coming on like the shape of a flame of fire, and then he moved the mist to the right and the left, and I could see that there were thousands of rats with their eyes blazing red like his, only smaller. He held up his hand, and they all stopped, and I thought he seemed to be saying, All these lives I will give to you, I and many more, and greater, through countless ages, if you will fall down and worship me. And then a red cloud like the color of blood seemed to close over my eyes, and before I knew what I was doing, I found myself opening the sash and saying to him, uh, come in, Lord and Master. The rats were all gone, but he slid into the room through the sash, though it was only open an inch wide, just as the moon herself has often come in through the tiniest crack, and has stood before me in all her size and splendour. His voice was weaker, so I moistened his lips with the brandy again, and he continued, but it seemed as though his memory had gone on working in the interval his story was further advanced. I was about to call him back to the point, but Van Helsing whispered to me, Let him go on. Do not interrupt him. He cannot go back, and maybe could not proceed at all, if once he lost the thread of his thought. He proceeded. All day I waited to hear from him, but he did not send me anything, not even a blowfly. And when the moon got up, I was pretty angry with him. When he did slide in through the window, though it was shut, he did not even knock. I got mad with him. He sneered at me, and his white face looked out of the mist, with his red eyes gleaming. 
and he went on as though he owned the whole place and I was no one. He didn't even smell the same as he went by me. I couldn't hold him. I thought that somehow Mrs. Harker had come into the room. The two men sitting on the bed stood up and came over, standing behind him so that he couldn't see them, but where they could hear better. They were both silent, but the professor started and quivered. His face, however, grew grimmer and sterner still. Renfield went on without noticing. When Mrs. Harker came in to see me this afternoon, she wasn't the same. It was like tea after the teapot has been watered. Here we all moved, but no one said a word. He went on. I didn't know that she was here till she spoke, and she didn't look the same. I don't care for pale people. I like them with lots of blood in them, and hers all seemed to have run out. I didn't think of it at the time, but when she went away, I began to think, and it made me mad to know that he had been taking the life out of her. I could feel that the rest quivered, as I did, but we remained otherwise still. So, when he came tonight, I was ready for him. I saw the mist stealing in, and I grabbed it tight. I'd heard that madmen have a natural strength, and as I knew I was a madman at times, anyhow, I resolved to use my power. I and he felt it too, for he had to come out of the mist to struggle with me. I held tight, and I thought I was going to win, for I didn't mean him to take any more of her life, till I saw his eyes... They burned into me, and my strength became like water. He slipped through it, and when I tried to cling to him, he raised me up and flung me down. There was a red cloud before me, and a noise like thunder, and the mist seemed to steal away under the door. His voice was becoming fainter, and his breath more stertorous. Van Helsing stood up instinctively. We know the first now, he said. He is here and we know his purpose. It may not be too late. Let us be armed, the same as we were the other night, but lose no time as there is not an instant to spare. There was no need to put our fear, nay our conviction, into words we shared them in common. We all hurried and took from our rooms the same things that we had when we entered the Count's house. The professor had his ready, and as we met in the corridor he pointed to them significantly as he said, they never leave me, and they shall not till this unhappy business is over. Be wise also, my friends. It is no common enemy that we deal with. Alas, alas, that dear Madame Mina should suffer. He stopped. His voice was breaking. And I do not know if rage or terror predominated in my own heart. Outside the Harker's door we paused. Art and Quincy held back, and the latter said, should we disturb her? We must, said Van Helsing grimly. If the door be locked, I shall break it in. M may it not frighten her terribly. It's unusual to break into a lady's room, Van Helsing said solemnly. You are always right, but this is life and death. All chambers are alike to the doctor, and even were they not, they are all as one to me tonight. Friend John, when I turn the handle, if the door does not open, do you put your shoulder down and shove? And you too, my friends, now. He turned the handle as he spoke, but the door did not yield. We threw ourselves against it. With a crash it burst open, and we almost fell headlong into the room. The professor did actually fall, and I saw across him as he gathered himself up from hands and knees. What I saw... What I saw appalled me. I felt my hair rise like bristles on the back of my neck, and my heart seemed to stand still. The moonlight was so bright that through the thick yellow blind the room was light enough to see. On the bed beside the window lay Jonathan Harker, his face flushed and breathing heavily as though in a stupor. Kneeling on the near edge of the bed facing outwards was the white-clad figure of his wife, by her side stood a tall, thin man, clad in black. His face 
was turned from us. But the instant we saw, we all recognized the Count. In every way, even to the scar on his forehead. With his left hand he held both Mrs. Harker's hands, keeping them away with her arms at full tension. His right hand gripped her by the back of the neck, forcing her face down on his bosom. Her white nightdress was smeared with blood, and a thin stream trickled down the man's bare chest, which was shown by his torn open dress. The attitude of the two had a terrible resemblance to a child forcing a kitten's nose into a saucer of milk to compel it to drink. As we burst into the room, the Count turned his face, and the hellish look that I had heard described seemed to leap into it. His eyes flamed red with devilish passion. The great nostrils of the white aquiline nose opened wide and quivered at the edge, and the white sharp teeth behind the full lips of the blood-dripping mouth clamped together like those of a wild beast. With a wrench which threw his victim back upon the bed as though hurled from a height, he turned and sprang at us. But by this time the professor had gained his feet and was holding towards him the envelope which contained the sacred wafer. The Count suddenly stopped, just as poor Lucy had done outside the tomb, and cowered back. Further and further he cowered, as we, lifting our crucifixes, advanced. The moonlight suddenly failed, as a great black cloud sailed across the sky, and when the gaslight sprang up under Quincy's match, we saw nothing but a faint vapour. This, as we looked, trailed under the door, which, with the recoil from its bursting open, had swung back to its old position. Van Helsing, Art, and I moved forward to Mrs. Harker, who by this time had drawn her breath, and with it had given a scream so wild, so ear-piercing, so despairing, that it seems to me now that it will ring in my ears till my dying day. For a few seconds she lay in her helpless attitude and disarray. Her face was ghastly, with a pallor which was accentuated by the blood which smeared her lips and cheeks and chin. From her throat trickled a thin stream of blood. Her eyes were mad with terror. Then she put before her face a poor crushed hands which bore on their whiteness the red mark of the Count's terrible grip, and from behind them came a low, desolate wail which made the terrible scream seem only the quick expression of an endless grief. Van Helsing stepped forward and drew the coverlet gently over her body, whilst Art, after looking at her face for an instant despairingly, ran out of the room. Van Helsing whispered to me, Jonathan is in a stupor such as we know the vampire can produce. We can do nothing with the poor Madame Mina for a few moments till she recovers herself. I must wake him. He dipped the end of a towel in cold water and with it began to flick him on the face, his wife all the while holding her face between her hands and sobbing in a way that was heartbreaking to hear. I raised the blind and looked out of the window. There was much moonshine and as I looked I could see Quincy Morris run across the lawn and hide himself in the shadow of a great yew tree. It puzzled me to think why he was doing this, but at the instant I heard Harker's quick exclamation as he woke to partial consciousness and turned to the bed. On his face, as there might well be, was a look of wild amazement. He seemed dazed for a few seconds, and then full consciousness seemed to burst upon him all at once, and he started up. His wife was aroused by the quick movement and turned to him with her arms stretched out as though to embrace him. Instantly, however, she drew them in again and putting her elbows together held her hands before her face and shuddered till the bed beneath her shook. In God's name, what does this mean? Harker cried out. Dr. Seward, Van Helsing, what is it? What's happened? What's wrong? Mina, Mina, dear, dear, what is it? What does that blood mean? My God, my God, has it come to this? And raising himself to his knees, he beat his hands wildly together. Good God, help us, help her, oh, help her. With a quick movement, he jumped from the bed and began to pull on his clothes. All the man in him awake at the need for instant exertion. 
What has happened? Tell me all about it, he cried without pausing. Dr. Van Helsing, you love Mina, I know. Oh, do something to save her. It, it cannot have gone too far yet. Guard her while I look for him. His wife, through her terror and horror and distress, saw some sure danger to him. Instantly forgetting her own grief, she seized hold of him and cried out, No, no, Jonathan, you must not leave me. I have suffered enough tonight. God knows without the dread of his harming you. You must stay with me. Stay with these friends who will watch over you. Her expression became frantic as she spoke, and he yielded to her. She pulled him down, sitting on the bedside, and clung to him fiercely. Van Helsing and I tried to calm them both. The professor held up his golden crucifix and said, with wonderful calmness, Do not fear, my dear, we are here, and while this is close to you, no foul thing can approach. You are safe for tonight, and we must be calm and take counsel together. She shuddered and was silent, holding down her head on her husband's breast. When she raised it, his white night robe was stained with blood where her lips had touched and where the thin open wound in the neck had sent forth drops. The instant she saw it, she drew back with a low wail and whispered amidst choking sobs, Unclean! Unclean! I must touch him or kiss him no more! Oh, that it should be that it is I who am now his worst enemy, and whom he may have most cause to fear. To this he spoke out resolutely. Nonsense, Mina! It is a shame to me to hear such a word. I would not hear it of you, and I shall not hear it from you. May God judge me by my deserts and punish me with more bitter suffering than even this hour, if by any act or will of mine anything ever come between us. He put out his arms and folded her to his breast, and for a while she lay there sobbing. He looked at us over her bowed head, with eyes that blinked damply above his quivering nostrils. His mouth was set as steel. After a while, her sobs became less frequent and more faint, and then he said to me, speaking with a studied calmness which I felt tried his nervous power to the utmost, And now, Dr. Seward, tell me all about it. Too well I know the broad fact. Tell me all that has been. I told him exactly what had happened, and he listened with seeming impassiveness, but his nostrils twitched and his eyes blazed as I told how the ruthless hands of the Count had held his wife in that terrible and horrid position with her mouth to the open wound in his breast. It interested me even at that moment to see that whilst the face of white-set passion worked convulsively over the bowed head, the hands tenderly and lovingly stroked the ruffled hair. Just as I had finished, Quincing and Godalming knocked at the door. They entered in obedience to our summons. Van Helsing looked at me questioningly. I understood him to mean if we were to take advantage of their coming to divert, if possible, the thoughts of the unhappy husband and wife from each other or from themselves. So on nodding acquiescence to him, he asked them what they had seen or done. To which Lord Godalming answered, No, I couldn't see him anywhere in the passage or in any of our rooms. I looked in the study, but though he had been there, he had gone. He had, however, he stopped suddenly looking at the poor drooping figure on the bed. Van Helsing said gravely, Go on, friend Arthur. We want here no more concealments. Our hope now is in knowing all. Tell freely. So Art went on. He had been there, and though it could only have been for a few seconds, he made rare hay of the place. All the manuscript had been burned, and the blue flames were flickering amongst the white ashes, and the cylinders of your phonograph too were thrown on the fire, and the wax had helped the flames. Here I interrupted. Thank God there's the other copy in the safe. His face lit for a moment, but fell again as he went on. I ran downstairs then, but could see no sign of him. I licked in on Renfield's room, but there was no trace there except... Again he paused. Go on, said Harker hoarsely. So he bowed his head, and moistening his lips with his tongue, added, Except uh, that the poor fellow's dead. Mrs. Harker raised her head, looking from one to the other of us. She said solemnly, God's will be done. I couldn't but feel that Art was keeping back something. But as I took it that it was with a purpose, I said nothing. 
Van Helsing turned to Morris and asked, And your friends, Quincy, have you any to tell? A little, he answered. It may be much eventually, but at present I, I can't say. I thought it well to know, if possible, where the Count would go when he left the house. I didn't see him, but I saw a bat rise from Renfield's window and flap westward. I expected to see him in some shape go back to Carfax, but he evidently sought some other lair. He will not be back tonight, for the sky is reddening in the east and the dawn is close. We must work tomorrow. He said the latter words through his shut teeth. For a space of perhaps a couple of minutes there was silence, and I could fancy that I could hear the sound of our hearts beating. Then Van Helsing said, placing his hand tenderly on Mrs. Harker's head, And now, Madame Mina, poor dear, dear Madame Mina, tell us exactly what happened. God knows that I do not want that you be pained, but it is need that we know all. For now, more than ever, has all work to be done quick and sharp, and in the deadly earnest. The day is close to us that must end all, if it may be so, and now is the chance that we may live and learn. The poor dear lady shivered, and I could see the tension of her nerves as she clasped her husband closer to her and bent her head lower and lower still on his breast. Then she raised her head proudly and held out one hand to Van Helsing, who took it in his, and after stooping and kissing it reverently, held it fast. The other hand was locked in that of her husband who held his other arm thrown around her protectingly. After a pause in which she was evidently ordering her thoughts, she began. I took the sleeping draught which you had so kindly given me, but for a long time it didn't act. I seemed to become more wakeful, and myriads of horrible fancies began to crowd in upon my mind, all of them connected with death and vampires, with blood and pain and trouble. A husband involuntarily groaned as she turned to him and said lovingly, Do not fret, dear. You must be brave and strong and help me through the horrible task. If you only knew what an effort it is for me to tell of this fearful thing at all, you would understand how much I need your help. Well, I saw I must try to help the medicine to its work with my will, if it was to do me any good, so I resolutely set myself to sleep. Sure enough, sleep must soon have come to me, for I remember no more. Jonathan coming in hadn't waked me, for he lay by my side when next I remember. There was in the room the same thin white mist that I had before noticed, but I forget now if you know of this. You will find it in my diary, which I'll show you later. I felt the same vague terror which had come to me before, and the same sense of some presence. I, I turned to wake Jonathan, but found that he slept so soundly that it seemed as if it was he who had taken the sleeping draught and not I. I tried, but I couldn't wake him. This caused me a great fear, and I looked around terrified. Then indeed, my heart sank within me, beside the bed, as if he had stepped out of the mist, or rather, as if the mist had turned into his figure, for it had entirely disappeared. Stood a tall, thin man, all in black. I knew him at once from the description of the others. The waxen face, the high aquiline nose on which the light fell in a thin white line, the parted red lips with the sharp white teeth showing between, and the red eyes that I had seemed to see in the sunset on the windows of St. Mary's Church at Whitby. I knew, too, the red scar on his forehead where Jonathan had struck him. For an instant, my heart stood still, and I would have screamed out only that I was paralysed. In the pause he spoke in a sort of keen, cutting whisper, pointing as he spoke to Jonathan. Silence. If you make a sound, I shall take him and dash his brains out before your very eyes. I was appalled and was too bewildered to do or say anything. With a mocking smile, he placed one hand upon my shoulder and holding me tight, 
bared my throat with the other, saying as he did so, First, a little refreshment to reward my exertions. You may as well be quiet. It is not the first time or the second that your veins have appeased my thirst. I was bewildered, and strangely enough I did not want to hinder him. I suppose it's part of the horrible curse that such is when his touch is on the victim. And oh my God, my God, pity me. He placed his reeking lips on my throat. Her husband groaned again. She clasped his hand harder and looked at him pityingly, as if he were the injured one, and went on. I, I felt my strength fading away, and I was in a half swoon. How long this horrible thing lasted, I know not, but it seemed that a long time must have passed before he took his foul, awful, sneering mouth away. I saw it drip with the fresh blood. Then remembrance seemed for a while to overpower her, and she drooped and would have sunk down but for her husband's sustaining arm. With a great effort she recovered herself and went on. Then he spoke to me mockingly, and so you, like the others, would play your brains against mine. You would help these men to hunt me and frustrate me in my design. You know now, and they know in part already, and will know in full before long, what it is to cross my path. They should have kept their energies for use closer to home. Whilst they played wits against me, against me, who commanded nations and intrigued for them and fought for them hundreds of years before they were born. I was countermining them, and you, their best beloved one, are now to me, flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, kin of my kin my bountiful wine press for a while, and shall be later on my companion and my helper. You shall be avenged in turn, for not one of them but shall minister to your needs, but as yet you are to be punished for what you have done. You have aided in thwarting me. Now you shall come to my call. When my brain says come to you, you shall cross land or sea to do my bidding, and to that end, this. With that, he pulled open his shirt and with his long, sharp nails opened a vein in his breast. When the blood began to spurt out, he took my hands in one of his, holding them tight, and with the other seized my neck and pressed my mouth to the wound, so that I must either suffocate or swallow some of the... My God! My God, what have I done? What have I done to deserve such a fate? I who have tried to walk in meekness and righteousness all my days. God pity me. Look down on a poor soul in worse than mortal peril, and in mercy pity those to whom she is dear. Then she began to rub her lips as though to cleanse them from pollution. As she was telling her terrible story, the eastern sky began to quicken and everything became more and more clear. Harker was still and quiet, but over his face, as the awful narrative went on, came a grey look, which deepened and deepened in the morning light, till when the first red streak of the coming dawn shot up, the flesh stood darkly out against the whitening hair. We have arranged that one of us is to stay within call of the unhappy pair till we can meet together, and arrange about taking action. Of this I am sure. The sun rises today on no more miserable house in all the great round of its daily course. Chapter 22 Jonathan Harker's Diary 3rd of October As I must do something or go mad, I write this diary. It is now six o'clock, and we are to meet in the study in half an hour and take something to eat, for Dr. Van Helsing and Dr. Seward are agreed that if we do not eat, we cannot work our best. Our best will be, God knows, required today. I must keep writing at every chance, for I dare not stop to think. All, big and little, must go down. Perhaps at the end the little things may teach us most. 
The teaching, big or little, could not have landed Mina or me anywhere worse than we are today. However, we must trust and hope. Poor Mina told me just now, with the tears running down her dear cheeks, that it is in trouble and trial that our faith is tested, that we must keep on trusting, and that God will aid us up to the end. The end? Oh my God! What end? To work, to work. When Van Helsing and Dr. Seward had come back from seeing poor Renfield, we went gravely into what was to be done. First, Dr. Seward told us that when he and Van Helsing had gone down to the room below how they had found Renfield lying on the floor, all in a heap, his face was all bruised and crushed in, and the bones of his neck were broken. Dr. Seward asked the attendant who was on duty in the passage if he had heard anything. He said that he had been sitting down. He confessed to half-dozing when he heard loud voices in the room. And then Renfield had called out loudly several times, God! 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 After that, uh, there was the sound of falling. And when he entered the room, he found him lying on the floor face down, just as the doctors had seen him. Van Helsing asked if he had heard voices or a voice, and he said he couldn't say. That, at first, it had seemed to him as if there were two, but as there was no one in the room, it could have only been one. He could swear to it, if required that the word God was spoken by the patient. Dr. Seward said to us when we were alone that he did not wish to go into the matter. The question of an inquest had to be considered, and it would never do to put forward the truth, as no one would believe it. As it was, he thought that on the attendant's evidence he could give a certificate of death by misadventure in falling from bed. In case the coroner should demand it, there would be a formal inquest necessarily to the same result. When the question began to be discussed as to what should be our next step, the very first thing we decided was that Mina should be in full confidence, that nothing of any sort, no matter how painful, should be kept from her. She herself agreed as to its wisdom, and it was pitiful to see her so brave and yet so sorrowful and in such a depth of despair. There must be no concealment, she said. Alas! We have had too much already, and besides, there's nothing in all the world that can give me more pain than I have already endured, than I suffer now. Whatever may happen, it must be of new hope or of new courage to me. Van Helsing was looking at her fixedly as she spoke and said suddenly, but quietly, But dear Madame Mina, are you not afraid, not for yourself, but for others from yourself? After what has happened, her face grew set in its lines, but her eyes shone with the devotion of a martyr as she answered, Ah, no, for my mind is made up. To what? he asked gently, whilst we were all very still, for each in our own way we had a sort of vague idea of what she meant. Her answer came with direct simplicity as though she was simply stating a fact. Because if I find in myself, and I shall watch keenly for it, a sign of harm to any that I love, I shall die. You would not kill yourself, he asked hoarsely. I would, if there were no friend who loved me, who would save me such a pain and so desperate an effort. She looked at him meaningly as she spoke. He was sitting down, but now he rose and came close to her, and put his hand on her head as he said solemnly, My child, there is such a one if it were for your good. For myself, I could hold it in my account with God to find such a euthanasia for you, even at this moment if it were best. Nay, were it safe. But my child... For a moment he seemed choked, and a great sob rose in his throat. He gulped it down and went on. There are here some who would stand between you and death. You must not die. You must not die by any hand, but least of all your own, until the other who has fouled your sweet life is true dead. You must not die. For if he is still with the quick undead, 
your death would make you even as he is. No, you must live. You must struggle and strive to live. Though death would seem a boon unspeakable, you must fight death himself. Though he come to you in pain or in joy, by the day or the night, in safety or in peril, on your living soul I charge you that you do not die, nay, nor think of death, till this great evil be past. The poor dear grew white as death, and she shook and shivered, as I have seen a quicksand shake and shiver at the incoming of the tide. We were all silent. We could do nothing. At length, she grew more calm, and turning to him said sweetly, but oh so sorrowfully, as she held out her hand, I promise you, my dear friend, that if God will let me live, I shall strive to do so, till, if it may be in his good time, this horror may have passed away from me. She was so good and brave that we all felt that our hearts were strengthened to work and endure for her, and we began to discuss what we were to do. I told her that she was to have all the papers in the safe, and all the papers or diaries and phonographs we might hereafter use, and was to keep the record as she had done before. She was pleased with the prospect of anything to do, if pleased, could be used in connection with so grim an interest. As usual, Van Helsing had thought ahead of everyone else, and was prepared with an exact ordering of our work. It is perhaps well, he said, that our meeting after our visit to Carfax we decided not to do anything with the earth boxes that lay there. Had we done so, the Count must have guessed our purpose, and would doubtless have taken measures in advance to frustrate such an effort with regard to the others. But now he does not know our intentions. Nay, more, in all probability, he does not know that such a power exists to us as can sterilize his lairs so that he cannot use them as of old. We are now so much further advanced in our knowledge as to their disposition that when we have examined the house in Piccadilly, we may track the very last of them. Today, then, is ours, and in it rests our hope. The sun that rose on our sorrows this morning guards us in its course. Until it sets tonight, that monster must retain whatever form he now has. He is confined within the limitations of his earthly envelope. He cannot melt into thin air, nor disappear through cracks or chinks or crannies. If he go through a doorway, he must open the door like a mortal. And so, we have this day to hunt out all his lairs and sterilize them. So we shall. If we have not yet catch him and destroy him, drive him to bay in some place where the catching and the destroying shall be in time sure. Here I started up for I couldn't contain myself at the thought that the minutes and seconds so preciously laden with Mina's life and happiness were flying from us. Since whilst we talked, action was impossible. But Van Helsing held up his hand warningly. Nay, friend Jonathan, he said, in this, the quickest way home is the longest way, so your proverbs say. We shall all act and act with desperate quick when the time has come. But think, in all probable, the key of the situation is in that house in Piccadilly. The Count may have many houses which he has bought. Of them, he will have deeds of purchase, keys, and other things. He will have paper that he write on. He will have his book of checks. 
there are many belongings that he must have somewhere. Why not in this place, so central, so quiet, where he come and go by the front or the back at all hours, when in the very vast of the traffic there is none to notice? We shall go there and search that house, and when we learn what it holds, then we do what our friend Arthur call in his phrases of hunt, stop the earths. And so we run down our old fox. So is it not? Then let us come at once, I cried. We are wasting the precious, precious time. The professor didn't move, but simply said, And how are we to get into that house in Piccadilly? Anyway, I cried, we shall break in if need be. And your police, where will they be? And what will they say? I was staggered, but I knew that if he wished to delay, he had a good reason for it. So I said as quietly as I could, Don't wait more than need be. You know I am sure what torture I am in. Ah, my child, that I do. And indeed, there is no wish of me to add to your anguish. But just think, what can we do until all the world be at movement? Then will come our time. I have thought and thought, and it seems to me that the simplest way is the best of all. Now, we wish to get into the house, but we have no key. Is it not so? I nodded. Now, suppose that you were, in truth, the owner of that house and could not still get in, and think... There was to you no conscience of the housebreaker. What would you do? I should get a respectable locksmith and set him to work it to pick the lock for me. And your police, they would interfere, would they not? Oh no, not if they knew the man was properly employed. Then, he looked at me as keenly as he spoke, all that is in doubt is the conscience of the employer and the belief of your policemen as to whether or not that employer has a good conscience, or a bad one. Your police must indeed be zealous men and clever, oh, so clever, in reading the heart, that they trouble themselves in such a matter. No, no, my friend Jonathan, you go take the lock off a hundred empty houses in this your London, or of any city in the world, and if you do it as such things are rightly done, and at the time such things are rightly done, no one will interfere. I have read of a gentleman who owned so fine a house in London, and when he went for months of summer to Switzerland and lock up the house, some burglar come and broke window at back and got in. Then he went and made open the shutters in front and walk out and in through the door before the very eyes of the police. Then he have an auction in that house and advertise it and put up big notice. And when the day come, he sell off by a great auctioneer all the goods of that other man who owns them. Then he go to a builder and he sell him that house, making an agreement that he pull it down and take all away within a certain time. And your police and other authority help him all they can. And when that owner come back from his holiday in Switzerland, he find only an empty hole where his house had been. This was all done en règle, and in our work we shall be en règle too. We shall not go so early that the policemen who have then little to think of 
shall deem it strange. But we shall go after ten o'clock, when there are many about, and such things would be done were we indeed owners of the house. I couldn't but see how right he was, and the terrible despair of Mina's face became relaxed in thought. There was hope in such good counsel. And Helsing went on. Then once within that house we may find more clues. At any rate, some of us can remain there whilst the rest find the other places where there be more earth boxes at Bermondsey and Mile End. Lord Godalming stood up. I can be of some use here, he said. I shall wire to my people to have horses and carriages where they will be most convenient. Look here, old fellow, said Morris. It is a capital idea to have all ready in case we want to go horsebacking. But don't you think that one of your snappy carriages with its heraldic adornments in a byway of Walworth or Mile End would attract too much attention for our purpose? It seems to me that we ought to take cabs when we go south or east and even leave them somewhere near the neighborhood we're going to. Friends, Quincy is right, said the professor. His head is what you call in plain with the horizon. It is a difficult thing that we go to do, and we do not want no peoples to watch us, if so it may. Mina took a growing interest in everything, and I was rejoiced to see that the exigency of affairs was helping her to forget, for a time, the terrible experience of the night. She was very, very pale, almost ghastly, and so thin that her lips were drawn away, showing her teeth in somewhat prominence. I did not mention this last, lest it should give her needless pain, but it made my blood run cold in my veins to think of what had occurred with poor Lucy when the Count had sucked her blood. As yet, there was no sign of the teeth growing sharper, but the time as yet was short, and there was time for fear. When we came to the discussion of the sequence of our efforts and of the disposition of our forces, there were new sources of doubt. It was finally agreed that before starting for Piccadilly, we should destroy the Count's lair close at hand. In case he should find it out too soon, we should thus be still ahead of him in our work of destruction, and his presence in his purely material shape, and at his weakest, might give us some new clue. As to the disposal of forces, it was suggested by the Professor that after our visit to Carfax, we should all enter the house in Piccadilly, that the two doctors and I should remain there whilst Lord Godalming and Quincy found the lairs at Walworth and Mile End and destroyed them. It was possible, if not likely, the Professor urged, that the Count might appear in Piccadilly during the day, and that if so, we might be able to cope with him then and there. At any rate, we might be able to follow him in force. To this plan I strenuously objected, and so far as my going was concerned, for I said that I intended to stay and protect Mina, I thought that my mind was made up on the subject, but Mina wouldn't listen to my objection. She said that there might be some law matter in which I could be useful, that amongst the Count's papers might be some clue which I could understand out of my experience in Transylvania, and that, as it was, all the strength we could muster was required to cope with the Count's extraordinary power. I had to give in, for Mina's resolution was fixed. She said that it was the last hope for her that we should all work together. As for me, she said, I have no fear. Things have been as bad as they can be, and whatever may happen must have in it some element of hope or comfort. Go, my husband. God can, if he wishes it, guard me as well alone as with anyone present. So I started up, crying out, Then in God's name let us come at once, for we are losing time. The Count may come to Piccadilly earlier than we think. Not so, said Van Helsing, holding up his hand. But why? I asked. Do you forget, he said, with actually a smile, that last night he banqueted heavily and will sleep late. 
Did I forget? Shall I ever? Can I ever? Can any of us ever forget that terrible scene? Mina struggled hard to keep her brave countenance, but the pain overmastered her, and she put her hands before her face and shuddered whilst she moaned. Van Helsing had not intended to recall her frightful experience. He had simply lost sight of her and her part in the affair in his intellectual effort. When it struck him what he said, he was horrified at his thoughtlessness and tried to comfort her. Oh, Madame Mina, he said, dear, dear Madame Mina, alas, that I of all who so reverence you should have said anything so forgetful. These stupid old lips of mine and this stupid old head do not deserve so. But you will forget it, will you not? He bent low beside her as he spoke. She took his hand and looking at him through her tears said hoarsely, No, I shall not forget, for it is well that I remember. And with it I have so much in memory of you that it is sweet that I take it all together. Now, you must all be going soon. Breakfast is ready, and we must all eat that we may be strong. Breakfast was a strange meal to us all. We tried to be cheerful and encourage each other, and Mina was the brightest and most cheerful of us. When it was over, Van Helsing stood up and said, Now, my dear friends, we shall go forth to our terrible enterprise. Are we all armed as we were on that night when we first visited our enemy's lair, armed against ghostly as well as carnal attack? We all assured him. Then it is well. Now, Madame Mina, you are in any case quite safe here until the sunset, and before then we shall return. If we shall return. But before we go, let me see you armed against personal attack. I have myself, since you came down, prepared your chamber by the placing of things of which we know, so that he may not enter. Now, let me guard yourself. On your forehead I touch this piece of sacred wafer in the name of the Father, the Son, and... There was a fearful scream which almost froze our hearts to hear. As he had placed the wafer on Mina's forehead, it had seared. It had burned into the flesh as though it had been a piece of white-hot metal. My poor darling's brain had told her the significance of the fact as quickly as her nerves received the pain of it, and the two so overwhelmed her that her overwrought nature had its voice in that dreadful scream. But the words to her thought came quickly. The echo of the scream had not ceased to ring on the air when there came the reaction, and she sank on her knees on the floor in an agony of abasement, pulling her beautiful hair over her face as the leper of old his mantle. She wailed out, Unclean! Unclean! Even the Almighty shuns my polluted flesh. I must bear this mark of shame upon my forehead until the judgment day. They all paused. I had thrown myself beside her in an agony of helpless grief, and putting my arms around, held her tight. For a few minutes our sorrowful hearts beat together, whilst the friends around us turned away their eyes that ran tears silently. Then Van Helsing turned and said gravely, so gravely that I couldn't help feeling that he was in some way inspired and was stating things outside himself. It may be that you may have to bear that mark till God himself see fit, as he most surely shall, on the judgment day, to redress all wrongs of the earth and of his children that he has placed thereon. And, O oh, Madame Mina, my dear, my dear, may we who love you be there to see when that red scar the sign of God's knowledge of what has been, shall pass away and leave your forehead as pure as the heart we know. For so surely as we live, 
that scar shall pass away when God sees right to lift the burden that is hard upon us. Till then, we bear our cross, as his son did in obedience to his will. It may be that we are chosen instruments of his good pleasure, and that we assent to his bidding as that other through stripes and shame, through tears and blood, through doubts and fear, and all that makes the difference between God and man. There was hope in his words, and comfort, and they made for resignation. Mina and I both felt so, and simultaneously we each took one of the old man's hands and bent over and kissed it. Then, without a word, we all knelt down together, and all holding hands swore to be true to each other. We men pledged ourselves to raise the veil of sorrow from the head of her whom each in his own way we loved, and we prayed for help and guidance in the terrible task which lay before us. It was then time to start. So I said farewell to Mina, a parting which neither of us shall forget to our dying day, and we set out. To one thing I have made up my mind, if we find out that Mina must be a vampire in the end, then she shall not go into that unknown and terrible land alone. I suppose it is thus that in old times one vampire meant many, just as their hideous bodies could only rest in sacred earth, so the holiest love was the recruiting sergeant for their ghastly ranks. We entered Carfax without trouble, and found all things the same as on the first occasion. It was hard to believe that amongst so prosaic surroundings of neglect and dust and decay there was any ground for such fear as already we knew. Had not our minds been made up, and had there not been terrible memories to spur us on, we could hardly have proceeded with our task. We found no papers or any sign of use in the house, and in the old chapel the great boxes looked just as we had seen them last. Dr. Van Helsing said to us solemnly as we stood before him, And now, my friends, we have a duty here to do. We must sterilize this earth, so sacred of holy memories that he has brought from a far distant land for such fell use. He has chosen this earth because it has been holy. Thus we defeat him with his own weapon, for we make it more holy still. It was sanctified to such use of man. Now we sanctify it to God. As he spoke, he took from his bag a screwdriver and a wrench, and very soon the top of one of the cases was thrown open. The earth smelled musty and close, but we didn't somehow seem to mind, for our attention was concentrated on the professor. Taking from his box a piece of the sacred wafer, he laid it reverently on the earth, and then shutting down the lid, began to screw it home, we aiding him as he worked. One by one we treated in the same way each of the great boxes, and left them as we had found them to all appearance. But in each was a portion of the host. When we closed the door behind us, the professor said solemnly, So much is already done. It may be that with all the others we can be so successful. Then the sunset of this evening may shine of Madame Mina's forehead, all white as ivory and with no stain. As we passed across the lawn on our way to the station to catch our train, we could see the front of the asylum. I looked eagerly, and in the window of my own room saw Mina. I waved my hand to her and nodded to tell that our work there was successfully accomplished. She nodded in reply to show that she understood. The last I saw, she was waving her hand in farewell. 
It was with a heavy heart that we sought the station and just caught the train, which was steaming in as we reached the platform. I have written this in the train. Piccadilly, 12.30 o'clock. Just before we reached Fenchurch Street, Lord Godalming said to me, Quincy and I will find a locksmith. You had better not come with us in case there should be any difficulty, for under the circumstances it wouldn't seem so bad for us to break into an empty house, but you are a solicitor, and the Incorporated Law Society might tell you that you should have known better. I demurred as to my not sharing any danger even of odium, but he went on. Besides, it will attract less attention if there are not too many of us. My title will make it all right with a locksmith, or with any policeman that may come along. You had better go with Jack and the professor and stay in the green park, somewhere in sight of the house. And when you see the door opened and the smith has gone away, do you all come across? We shall be on the lookout for you and shall let you in. The advice is good, said Van Helsing, so we said no more. Godalming and Morris hurried off in a cab, we following in another. At the corner of Arlington Street, our contingent got out and strolled into the green park. My heart beat as I saw the house on which so much of our hope was centred, looming up, grim and silent in its deserted condition, amongst its more lively and spruce-looking neighbours. We sat down on a bench within good view and began to smoke cigars so as to attract as little attention as possible. The minutes seemed to pass with leaden feet as we waited for the coming of the others. At length, we saw four-wheeler drive up. Out of it, in leisurely fashion, got Lord Godalming and Morris, and down from the box descended a thick-set working man with his rush-woven basket of tools. Morris paid the cabman who touched his hat and drove away. Together, the two ascended the steps, and Lord Godalming pointed out what he wanted done. The workman took off his coat leisurely and hung it on one of the spikes of the rail, saying something to a policeman who just then sauntered along. The policeman nodded acquiescence, and the man kneeling down placed his bag beside him. After searching through it, he took out a selection of tools, which he proceeded to lay beside him in orderly fashion. Then he stood up, looked in the keyhole, blew into it, and turning to his employers made some remark. Lord Godalming smiled, and the man lifted a good-sized bunch of keys. Selecting one of them, he began to probe the lock, as if feeling his way with it. After fumbling about for a bit, he tried a second, and then a third. All at once, the door opened under a slight push from him, and he and the two others entered the hall. We sat still. My own cigar burnt furiously, but Van Helsing's went cold altogether. We waited patiently as we saw the workman come out and bring his bag. Then he held the door partly open, steadying it with his knees, whilst he fitted a key to the lock. This he finally handed to Lord Godalming, who took out his purse and gave him something. The man touched his hat, took his bag, put on his coat, and departed. Not a soul took the slightest notice of the whole transaction. When the man had fairly gone, we three crossed the street and knocked at the door. It was immediately opened by Quincy Morris, beside whom stood Lord Godalming, lighting a cigar. The place smells so vilely, said the latter as we came in. It did indeed smell vilely, like the old chapel at Carfax. And with our previous experience, it was plain to us that the Count had been using the place pretty freely. We moved to explore the house, all keeping together in case of attack, for we knew we had a strong and wily enemy to deal with, and as yet we did not know whether the Count might not be in the house. In the dining room which lay at the back of the hall we found eight boxes of earth. Eight boxes only, out of the nine which we sought. Our work was not over, and would never be, until we should have found the missing box. First, we opened the shutters of the window which looked out across a narrow stone-flagged yard at the blank face of a stable, pointed to look like the front of a miniature house. There were no windows in it, so we were not afraid of being overlooked. We did not lose any time in examining the chests. 
With the tools which we had brought with us, we opened them, one by one, and treated them as we had treated those others in the old chapel. It was evident to us that the Count was not at present in the house, and we proceeded to search for any of his effects. After a cursory glance at the rest of the rooms, from basement to attic, we came to the conclusion that the dining room contained any effects which might belong to the Count, and so we proceeded to minutely examine them. They lay in a sort of orderly disorder on the great dining room table. There were title deeds of the Piccadilly House in a great bundle, deeds of the purchase of the houses at Mile End and Bermondsey, notepaper, envelopes and pens and ink. All were covered up in thin wrapping paper to keep them from the dust. There were also a clothes brush, a brush and comb and a jug and basin, the latter containing dirty water which was reddened as if with blood. Last of all was a little heap of keys of all sorts and sizes, probably those belonging to the other houses. When we had examined this last find, Lord Godalming and Quincy Morris, taking accurate notes of the various addresses of the houses in the east and south, took with them the keys in a great bunch and set out to destroy the boxes in these places. The rest of us are, with what patience we can, waiting their return, or the coming of the Count. Chapter 23 Dr. Seward's Diary 3rd of October The time seemed terribly long whilst we were waiting for the coming of Godalming and Quincy Morris. The professor tried to keep our minds active by using them all the time. I could see his beneficent purpose by the side glances which he threw from time to time at Harker. The poor fellow is overwhelmed in a misery that is appalling to see. Last night he was a frank, happy-looking man, with a strong, youthful face full of energy and with dark brown hair. Today he is a drawn, haggard old man, whose white hair marches well with the hollow burning eyes and the grief-written lines of his face. His energy is still intact. In fact, he is like a living flame. This may yet be his salvation, for if all go well, it will tide him over the despairing period. He will then, in a kind of way, wake again to the realities of life. Poor fellow, I thought my own trouble was bad enough, but his. The professor knows this well enough, and is doing his best to keep his mind active. What he has been saying was, under the circumstances of absorbing interest, so well as I can remember, here it is. I have studied over and over again, since they came into my hands, all the papers relating to this monster, and the more I have studied, the greater seems the necessity to utterly stamp him out. All through there are signs of his advance, not only of his power, but of his knowledge of it. As I learned from the researches of my friend Arminius of Budapest, he was in life a most wonderful man, soldier, statesman and alchemist, which latter was the highest development of the science knowledge of his time. He had a mighty brain, a learning beyond compare, and a heart that knew no fear and no remorse. He dared even to attend to Sholomans, and there was no branch of knowledge of his time that he did not essay. Well, in him the brain powers survived the physical death, though it would seem that the memory was not all complete. In some faculties of mind he has been and is only a child but he is growing, and in some things that were childish at the first are now of man's stature. He is experimenting, and doing it well, and if it had not been that we have crossed his path, he would be yet, he may be yet if we fail, 
the father or furtherer of a new order of beings whose road must lead through death, not life. Harker groaned and said, And this is all arrayed against my darling. But how is he experimenting? The knowledge may help us to defeat him. He has all along, since his coming, been trying his power, slowly but surely. The big child brain of his is working. Well, for us it is as yet a child brain. For had he dared at the first to attempt certain things, he would long ago have been beyond our power. However, he means to succeed, and a man who has centuries before him can afford to wait and to go slow. Vestina lente may well be his motto. I fail to understand, said Harker wearily. Oh, do be more plain to me. Perhaps grief and trouble are dulling my brain. The professor laid his hand tenderly on his shoulder as he spoke. Ah, my child, I will be plain. Do you not see how of late this monster has been creeping into knowledge experimentally? How he has been making use of the zoophagus patient to affect his entry into friend John's home. For your vampire, though in all afterwards he can come when and how he will, must at the first make entry only when asked thereto by an inmate. But these are not his most important experiments. Do we not see how at the first all these so great boxes were moved by others? He knew not then, but that must be so. But all the time that so great child brain of his was growing, and he began to consider whether he might not himself move the box. So he began to help. And then, when he found that this be all right, he tried to move them all alone. And so he progressed, and he scattered these graves of him. And none but he know where they are hidden. He may have intended to bury them deep in the ground, so that he only use them in the night, or at such time as he can change his form, they do him equal well, and none may know these are his hiding place. But, my child, do not despair. This knowledge came to him just too late. Already all of his lairs but one be sterilized as for him, and before the sunset this shall be so. Then he have no place where he can move and hide. I delayed this morning that so we might be sure. Is there not more at stake for us than for him? Then why not be more careful than him? By my clock it is one hour, but already if all be well, Friends Arthur and Quincy are on their way to us. Today is our day, and we must go sure, if slow, and lose no chance. See, there are five of us when those absent ones return. Whilst we were speaking, we were startled by a knock at the whole door, the double postman's knock of the telegraph boy. We all moved out to the hall with one impulse, and Van Helsing, holding up his hand to us to keep silence, stepped to the door and opened it. The boy handed in a dispatch. The professor closed the door again, and after looking at the direction, opened it and read aloud. Look out for D. He has just now, 1245, come from Carfax hurriedly and hastened towards the south. He seems to be going around and may want to see you. Mina. There was a pause, broken by Jonathan Harker's voice. Now, God be thanked, we shall soon meet. Van Helsing turned to him quickly and said, God will act in his own way and time. Do not fear, and do not rejoice, as yet. For what we wish for at the moment may be our own undoings. I care for nothing now, he answered hotly, except to wipe out this brute from the face of creation. I would sell my soul to do it. 
Oh, hush, hush, my child, said Van Helsing. God does not purchase souls in this wise, and the devil, though he may purchase, does not keep faith. But God is merciful and just, and knows your pain and your devotion to that dear Madame Mina. Think you how her pain would be doubled did she but hear your wild words. Do not fear any of us. We are all devoted to this cause, and today shall see the end. The time is coming for action. Today this vampire is limited to the powers of man. Until sunset, he may not change. It will take him time to arrive here. See, it is twenty minutes past one, and there are yet some times before he can hither come, be he never so quick. What we must hope for is that my Lord Arthur and Quincy arrive first. About half an hour after we'd received Mrs. Harker's telegram, there came a quiet, resolute knock at the hall door. It was just an ordinary knock, such as given hourly by thousands of gentlemen, but it made the professor's heart and mind beat loudly. We looked at each other and together moved out into the hall. We each held ready to use our various armaments, the spiritual in the left hand, the mortal in the right. Van Helsing pulled back the latch, and holding the door half open, stood back, having both hands ready for action. The gladness of our hearts must have shone upon our faces when on the step, close to the door, we saw Lord Godalming and Quincy Morris. They came in quickly and closed the door behind them, the former saying as they moved along the hall, It's all right, we found both places, six boxes in each, and we destroyed them all. Destroyed? asked the professor. For him, he was silent for a minute, and then Quincy said, There is nothing to do but to wait here. If, however, he doesn't turn up by five o'clock, we must start off, for it won't do to leave Mrs. Harker alone after sunset. He will be here before long now, said Van Helsing, who had been consulting his pocket book. Nota bene. In Madame's telegram he went south from Carfax. That means he went to cross the river, and he could only do so at slack of tide. It should be something before one o'clock. That he went south has a meaning for us. He is as yet only suspicious, and he went from Carfax first to the place where he would suspect interference least. You must have been at Bermondsey only a short time before him. That he is not here already shows that he went to Mile End next. This took him some time, for he would then have to be carried over the river in some way. Believe me, my friends, we shall not have long to wait now. We should have ready some plan of attack, so that we may throw away no chance. Hush, there is no time now. Have all your arms. Be ready. He held up a warning hand as he spoke, for we all could hear a key softly inserted in the lock of the hall door. I could not but admire, even at such a moment, the way in which a dominant spirit asserted itself. In all our hunting parties and adventures in different parts of the world, Quincy Morris had always been the one to arrange the plan of action and Arthur and I had been accustomed to obey him implicitly. Now the old habit seemed to be renewed instinctively. With a swift glance around the room, he had once laid out our plan of attack, and without speaking a word, with a gesture, placed us each in position. Van Helsing, Harker and I were just behind the door, so that when it was opened, the professor could guard it whilst we two stepped between the incomer and the door. Godalming behind and Quincy in front stood, just out of sight, ready to move in front of the window. We waited in a suspense that made the seconds pass with nightmare slowness. The slow, careful steps came along the hall. The Count was evidently prepared for some surprise. At least, he feared it. Suddenly, with a single bound, he leaped into the room, winning away past us before any of us could raise a hand to stay him. 
There was something so panther-like in the movement, something so unhuman, that it seemed to sober us all from the shock of his coming. The first to act was Harker, who with a quick movement threw himself before the door leading into the room in front of the house. As the Count saw us, a horrible sort of snarl passed over his face, showing the eye teeth long and pointed. But the evil smile has quickly passed into a cold stare of lion-like disdain. His expression again changed, as with a single impulse we all advanced upon him. It was a pity that we had not some better organised plan of attack, for even at the moment I wondered what we were to do. I did not myself know whether our lethal weapons would avail us anything. Harker evidently meant to try the matter, for he had ready his great cookery knife and made a fierce and sudden cut at him. The blow was a powerful one. Only the diabolical quickness of the Count's leap back saved him. A second less and a trenchant blade had shorn through his coat, making a wide gap once a bundle of banknotes and a stream of gold fell out. The expression of the Count's face was so hellish that for a moment I feared for Harker, though I saw him throw the terrible knife aloft again for another stroke. Instinctively I moved forward with a protective impulse, holding the crucifix and wafer in my left hand. I felt a mighty power fly along my arm, and it was without surprise that I saw the monster cower back before a similar movement made spontaneously by each one of us. It would be impossible to describe the expression of hate and baffled malignity, of anger and hellish rage, which came over the Count's face. His waxen hue became greenish-yellow by the contrast of his burning eyes, and the red scar on the forehead showed on the pallid skin like a palpitating wound. The next instant, with a sinuous dive, he swept under Harker's arm ere his blow could fall, and grasping a handful of the money from the floor, dashed across the room, threw himself at the window. Amid the crash and glitter of the falling glass, he tumbled into the flagged area below. Through the sound of the shivering glass, I could hear the ting of the gold as some of the sovereigns fell on the flagging. We ran over and saw him spring unhurt from the ground. He, rushing up the steps, crossed the flagged yard and pushed open the stable door. There he turned and spoke to us. You think to baffle me, you with your pale faces all in a row, like sheep in a butcher's. You shall be sorry yet, each one of you. You think you have left me without a place to rest, but I have more. My revenge is just begun. I spread it over centuries, and time is on my side. Your girls that you all love are mine already, and through them you and others shall yet be mine, my creatures, to do my bidding and to be my jackals when I want to feed. Ha! With a contemptuous sneer, He passed quickly through the door, and we heard the rusty bolt creak as he fastened it behind him. A door beyond opened and shut. The first of us to speak was the professor. Realising the difficulty of following him through the stable, we moved toward the hall. We have learned something, much. Notwithstanding his brave words, he fears us. He fears time. He fears want. For if not, why he hurry so? His very tone betray him, or my ears deceive. Why take that money? You follow quick. You are hunters of the wild beast and understand it so. For me, I make sure that nothing here may be of use to him, if so that he returns. As he spoke, he put the money remaining in his pocket, took the title deeds in the bundle as Harker had left them, and swept the remaining things into the open fireplace, where he set fire to them with a match. Godalming and Morris had rushed out into the yard, and Harker had lowered himself from the window to follow the Count. He had, however, bolted the stable door, and by the time they had forced it open, there was no sign of him. Van Helsing and I tried to make inquiry at the back of the house, but the mews was deserted, 
and no one had seen him depart. It was now late in the afternoon, and sunset was not far off. We had to recognise that our game was up. With heavy hearts, we agreed with the professor when he said, Let us go back to Madame Mina, poor, poor dear Madame Mina. All we can do now just is done, and we can there at least protect her. But we need not despair. There is but one more earth box, and we must try to find it. When that is done, all may yet be well. I could see that he spoke as bravely as he could to comfort Harker. The poor fellow was quite broken down. Now and again he gave a low groan which he couldn't suppress. He was thinking of his wife. With sad hearts we came back to my house where we found Mrs. Harker waiting for us with an appearance of cheerfulness which did honour to her bravery and unselfishness. When she saw our faces, her own became as pale as death. For a second or two, her eyes were closed as if she were in some secret prayer. And then she said cheerfully, I I can never thank you all enough. Oh, my poor darling. As she spoke, she took her husband's grey head in her hands and kissed it. Lay your poor head here and rest it. All will yet be well, dear. God will protect us, if he so will it, in his good intent. The poor fellow groaned. There was no place for words in his sublime misery. We had a sort of perfunctory supper together, and I think it cheered us all up somewhat. It was perhaps the mere animal heat of food to hungry people, for none of us had eaten anything since breakfast, or the sense of companionship may have helped us. But anyway, we were all less miserable, and saw the morrow as not altogether without hope. True to our promise, we told Mrs. Harker everything which had passed, and although she grew snowy white at times when danger had seemed to threaten her husband, and red at others when his devotion to her was manifested, she listened bravely and with calmness. When we came to the part where Harker had rushed at the Count so recklessly, she clung to her husband's arm and held it tight, as though her clinging could protect him from any harm that might come. She said nothing, however, till the narration was all done, and matters had been brought up to the present time. Then, without letting go her husband's hand, she stood up amongst us and spoke. Oh, that I could give any idea of the scene, of that sweet, sweet, good, good woman in all the radiant beauty of her youth and animation, with the red scar on her forehead, of which she was conscious, and which we saw with grinding of our teeth, remembering whence and how it came. Her loving kindness against our grim hate, a tender faith against all our fears and doubting, and we, knowing that so far as symbols went, she, with all her goodness and purity and faith, was outcast from God. Jonathan, she said, and the word sounded like music on her lips, it was so full of love and tenderness. Jonathan, dear, and you all, my true, true friends, I want you to bear something in mind through all this dreadful time. I know that you must fight, that you must destroy, even as you destroyed the false Lucy, so that the true Lucy might live hereafter. But it is not a work of hate. That poor soul who has wrought all this misery is the saddest case of all. Just think what will be his joy when he too is destroyed in his worser part that his better part may have spiritual immortality. You must be pitiful to him, too, though it may not hold your hands from his destruction. As she spoke, I could see her husband's face darken and draw together, as though the passion in him was shriveling his being to its core. Instinctively the clasp on his wife's hand grew closer, till his knuckles looked white. She did not flinch from the pain, which I knew she must have suffered, but looked at him with eyes that were more appealing than ever. As she stopped speaking, he leaped to his feet, almost tearing his hand from hers as he spoke. May God give him into my hand for just long enough to destroy that earthly life of him which we are aiming at. If beyond it I could send his soul for ever and ever to burning hell, I would do it. Oh, hush, hush, in the name of the good God! Don't say such things, Jonathan, my husband. 
or you will crush me with fear and horror. Just think, my dear, I have been thinking all this long, long day of it that perhaps someday I, I too may need such pity, and that some other like you, and with equal cause for anger, may deny it to me. Oh, my husband, my husband, indeed, I would have spared you such a thought had there been any other way. But I pray that God may have not treasured your wild words except as the heartbroken wail of a very loving and sorely stricken man. O oh God, let these poor white hairs go in evidence of what he has suffered, who all his life has done no wrong, and on whom so many sorrows have come. We men were all in tears now. There was no resisting them, and we wept openly. She wept too to see that her sweeter counsels had prevailed. Her husband flung himself on his knees beside her, and putting his arms round her, hid his face in the folds of her dress. Van Helsing beckoned to us, and we stole out of the room, leaving the two loving hearts alone with their god. Before they retired, the professor fixed up the room against any coming of the vampire, and assured Mrs. Harker that she might rest in peace. She tried to school herself to the belief, and manifestly for her husband's sake, tried to seem content. It was a brave struggle, and was, I think and believe, not without its reward. Van Helsing had placed at hand a bell, which either of them was to sound in case of any emergency. When they had retired, Quincy, Godalming and I arranged that we should sit up, dividing the night between us, and watch over the safety of the poor stricken lady. The first watch falls to Quincy, so the rest of us shall be off to bed as soon as we can. Godalming has already turned in, for his is the second watch. Now that my work is done, I too shall go to bed. Jonathan Harker's Journal 3rd, 4th of October, close to midnight I thought yesterday would never end. There was over me a yearning for sleep in some sort of blind belief that to wake would be to find things changed and that any change must now be for the better. Before we parted, we discussed what our next step was to be, but we could arrive at no result. All we knew was that one earth box remained, and that the Count alone knew where it was. If he chooses to lie hidden, he may baffle us for years. And in the meantime, the thought is too horrible, I dare not think of it even now. This I know, that if ever there was a woman who was all perfection, that one is my poor, wrong darling. I loved her a thousand times more for her sweet pity of last night, a pity that made my own hate of the monster seem despicable. Surely God will not permit the world to be the poorer by the loss of such a creature. This is hope to me. We are all drifting reefwards now, and faith is our only anchor. Thank God Mina's sleeping, and sleeping without dreams. I fear what her dreams might be like, with such terrible memories to ground them in. She has not been so calm within my seeing since the sunset. Then, for a while, there came over her face a repose which was like spring after the blasts of March. I thought at the time that it was the softness of the red sunset on her face, but somehow now I think it has a deeper meaning. I'm not sleeping myself, though I'm weary, weary to death. However, I must try to sleep, for there is tomorrow to think of, and there is no rest for me until... Later. I must have fallen asleep, for I was awakened by Mina, who was sitting up in bed, with a startled look on her face. I could see easily, for we didn't leave the room in darkness. She had placed a warning hand over my mouth, and now she whispered in my ear, Hush, there's someone in the corridor. I got up softly, and crossing the room, gently opened the door. Just outside, stretched on a mattress, lay Mr. Morris, wide awake. He raised a warning hand for silence, as he whispered to me, Hush, go back to bed. It's all right. One of us will be here all night. We don't mean to take any chances. His look and gesture forbade discussion. So I came back and told Mina. She sighed, and positively a shadow of a smile stole over her poor, pale face, 
as she put her arms around me and said softly, Oh, thank God for good brave men. With a sigh, she sank back again to sleep. I write this now, as I'm not sleepy, though I must try again. 4th of October, morning. Once again during the night, I was wakened by Mina. This time we had all had a good sleep. The grey of the coming dawn was making the windows into sharp oblongs, and the gas flame was like a speck rather than a disc of light. She said to me hurriedly, Go, call the professor. I want to see him at once. Why? I asked. I have an idea. I suppose it must have come in the night and matured without my knowing it. He must hypnotize me before the dawn, and then I shall be able to speak. Go quick, dearest. The time is getting close. I went to the door. Dr. Seward was resting on the mattress, and seeing me, he sprang to his feet. Is anything wrong? he asked in alarm. No, I replied, but Mina wants to see Dr. Van Helsing at once. I'll go, he said, and hurried into the professor's room. Two or three minutes later, Van Helsing was in the room in his dressing gown. Mr. Morris and Lord Godalming were with Dr. Seward at the door asking questions. When the professor saw Mina's smile, a positive smile ousted the anxiety of his face. He rubbed his hands as he said, Oh, my dear Madame Mina, this is indeed a change. See, friend Jonathan, we have got our dear Madame Mina as of old back to us today. Then turning to her, he said cheerfully, And what am I to do for you? For at this hour you do not want me for nothing. Uh, I want you to hypnotize me, she said. Do it before the dawn, for I feel that then I can speak and speak freely. Be quick, for the time is short. Without a word, he motioned her to sit up in bed. Looking fixedly at her, he commenced to make passes in front of her, from over the top of her head downward, with each hand in turn. Mina gazed at him fixedly for a few minutes, during which my own heart beat like a trip hammer, for I felt that some crisis was at hand. Gradually, her eyes closed, and she sat stock still. Only by the gentle heaving of her bosom could one know that she was alive. The professor made a few more passes and then stopped, and I could see that his forehead was covered with great beads of perspiration. Mina opened her eyes but she didn't seem the same woman. There was a faraway look in her eyes, and her voice had a sad dreaminess which was new to me. Raising his hand to impose silence, the professor motioned to me to bring the others in. They came on tiptoe, closing the door behind them, and stood at the foot of the bed, looking on. Mina appeared not to see them. The stillness was broken by Van Helsing's voice speaking in a low-level tone, which would not break the current of her thoughts. Where are you? The answer came in a neutral way. I, I, I don't know. Sleep has no place it can call its own. For several minutes there was silence. Mina sat rigid, and the professor stood staring at her fixedly. The rest of us hardly dared to breathe. The room was growing lighter. Without taking his eyes from Mina's face, Dr. Van Helsing motioned me to pull up the blind. I did so, and the day seemed just upon us. A red streak shot up and a rosy light seemed to diffuse itself through the room. On the instant, the professor spoke again. Where are you now? The answer came dreamily, but with intention. It were as though she were interpreting something. I have heard her use the same tone when reading her shorthand notes. I, I, I don't know. It, it's all strange to me. What do you see? I can see nothing. It's all dark. What do you hear? I could detect the strain in the professor's patient voice. The lapping water. It's, it's gurgling by and little waves leap. I can hear them on the outside. Then you are on a ship. We all looked at each other, trying to glean something each from the other. We were afraid to think. The answer came quick. Oh, oh yes. What else do you hear? Uh, the sound of men stamping overhead as they run about. The, there's a creaking of a chain and the loud tinkle as the check of the capstan falls into the ratchet. What are you doing? I am still. Oh, so still. It's like death. The voice faded away into a deep breath as of one sleeping, and the open eyes closed again. By this time the sun had risen 
and we were all in the full light of day. Dr. Van Helsing placed his hands on Mina's shoulders and laid her head down slow <clears throat> and laid her head down softly on her pillow. She lay like a sleeping child for a few moments, and then, with a long sigh, awoke and stared in wonder to see us all around her. Have I been talking in my sleep? was all she said. She seemed, however, to know the situation without telling, though she was eager to know what she had told. The professor repeated the conversation, and she said, Then there's not a moment to lose. It may not yet be too late. Mr. Morris and Lord Godalming started for the door, but the professor's calm voice called them back. Stay, my friends. That ship, wherever it was, was weighing anchor in the moment in your so great port of London. Which of them is it that you seek? God be thanked that we have once again a clue, so whither it may lead us, we know not. We have been blind somewhat, blind after the manner of men, since we can look back and see what we might have seen looking forward, if we had been able to see what we might have seen. Alas, but that sentence is a puzzle, is it not? We can now know what was in the Count's mind when he sees the money. Though Jonathan so fierce knife put him in the danger that even he dread. He meant escape. Hear me? Escape. He saw that with but one earth box left and a pack of men following like dogs after a fox, this London was no place for him. He have taken his last earth box on board a ship and he leave the land. He think to escape, but no, we follow him. Tally ho, as friend Arthur would say when he put on his red frock. Our old fox is wily, oh, so wily that we must follow his vile. I too am wily, and I think his mind in a little while. In the meantime, we may rest and in peace, for there are between us which he do not want to pass, and which he could not, if he would. Unless the ship were to touch the land, and then only at full or slack tide. See, and the sun is just rose, and all day to sunset is us. Let us take bath, and dress, and have breakfast which we all need and which we can eat comfortably, since he be not in the same land with us. Mina looked at him appealingly, as she asked. But why need we to seek him further when he is gone away from us? He took her hand and patted it as he replied. Ask me nothing as yet. When we have breakfast, then I answer all questions. He would say no more, when we separated to dress. After breakfast, Mina repeated her question. He looked at her gravely for a minute, and then said sorrowfully, Because, my dear, dear Madame Mina, now more than ever must we find him, even if we have to follow him to the jaws of hell. She grew paler, as she asked faintly, Why? Because, he answered solemnly, he can live for centuries. And you are but mortal woman. Time is now to be dreaded since once he put that mark upon your throat. I was just in time to catch her as she fell forward in a faint. Chapter 24 Dr. Seward's Phonograph Diary Spoken by Van Helsing This to Jonathan Harker. You are to stay with your dear Madame Mina. We shall go to make our search, if I can call it so. For it is not search but knowing, and we seek confirmation only. But do you stay and take care of her today? This is your best and most holiest office. This day nothing can find him here. Let me tell you that, so you will know what we four know already, for I have tell them. He, our enemy, have gone away. He have gone back to his castle in Transylvania, 
I know it so well, as if a great hand of fire wrote it on the wall. He have prepared for this in some way, and that last earth box was ready to ship somewhere. For this he took the money, for this he hurry at the last, lest we catch him before the sun go down. It was his last hope, save that he might hide in the tomb that he think poor Miss Lucy, being as he thought like him, keep open to him. But there was not of time. When that fail, he makes straight for his last resource, his last earthwork, I might say, did I wish double entente. He is clever, oh, so clever. He know that his game here was finished. And so he decide he go back home. He find ship going by the route he came, and he go in it. We go off now to find what ship and whither bound. When we have discovered that, we come back and tell you all. Then we will comfort you and poor Madame Mina with new hope. For it will be hope, when you think it over, that all is not lost. This very creature that we pursue, it takes hundreds of years to get so far as London. And yet, in one day, when we know of the disposal of him, we drive him out. He is finite, though he is powerful and do much harm and suffers not as we do. But we are strong, each in our purpose, and we are all more strong together. Take heart afresh, dear husband of Madame Mina. This battle is but begun, and in the end we shall win. So sure as that God sits on high to watch over his children, Therefore, be of much comfort till we return. Van Helsing Jonathan Harker's Journal, 4th of October When I read to Mina Van Helsing's message in the phonograph, the poor girl brightened up considerably. Already the certainty that the Count is out of the country has given her comfort, and comfort is strength to her. For my own part, now that his horrible danger is not face to face with us, it seems almost impossible to believe in it. Even my own terrible experiences in Castle Dracula seem like a long forgotten dream. Here in the crisp autumn air, in the bright sunlight. Alas, how can I disbelieve? In the midst of my thought, my eye fell on the red scar on my poor darling's white forehead. Whilst that lasts, there can be no disbelief. Mina and I fear to be idle, so we have been over all the diaries again and again. Somehow, although the reality seems greater each time, the pain and the fear seem less. There is something of a guiding purpose manifest throughout, which is comforting. Mina says that perhaps we are the instruments of ultimate good. It may be. I shall try to think, as she does. We have never spoken to each other yet of the future. It is better to wait till we see the professor and the others after their investigations. The day is running by more quickly than ever I thought a day could run for me again. It is now three o'clock. Mina Harker's journal, 5th of October, 5 p.m. Our meeting for report. Present, Professor Van Helsing, Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, Mr. Quincy Morris, Jonathan Harker, Mina Harker. Dr. Van Helsing described what steps were taken during the day to discover on what boat and whither bound Count Dracula made his escape. As I knew that he wanted to get back to Transylvania, I felt sure that he must go by the Danube mouth or by somewhere in the Black Sea, since by that way he come. It was a dreary blank that was before us. Omne ignotum pro magnifico. And so, with heavy hearts, we start to find what ships leave for the Black Sea last night. He was in sailing ship, since Madam Mina tell of sails being set. The is not so important as to go in your list of the shipping in the Times, and so we go, by suggestion of Lord Godalming, to your Lloyds, where are not of 
all ships that sail, however so small. There we find that only one black sea-bound ship go out of this tide. She is the Tsarina Catherine, and she sailed from Doolittle's Wharf or Barna, and thence to other ports and up the Danube. So, said I, this is the ship whereon is the count. So off we go to Doolittle's Wharf, and there we find a man in an office. From him we inquire of the goings of the Tsarina Catherine. He is very much, and he red face and loud of voice, but he good fellow all the same. And when Quincy give him something from his pocket, which crackle as he roll it up, and put it in so small a bag, which he have hid deep in his clothing, he is still better fellow, and humble servant to us. He come with us and ask many men who are rough and hot. These be better fellows too, when they have been no more thirsty. They say much of blood and bloom, and of others which I comprehend not, so I guess what they mean. But nevertheless, they tell us all things which we want to know. They make known to us among them how last afternoon at about five o'clock comes a man so hurry, a tall man, seen and pale, his high nose and teeth so white, and eyes that seem to be burning that he be all in black, except that he have a hat of straw, which suit him not, nor the time, that he scatter his money in making quick inquiry as to what ship sails for the Black Sea, and for where. Some took him to the office, and then to the ship, where he will not go aboard, but halt at shore end of gangplank, and ask that the captain come to him, the captain come, then told that he will be pay well, and so he swear much at the first he agree to term. Then the thin man go, and someone tell him where horse and cart can be hired. He go there, and soon he come again, himself driving cart on which a great box. This he himself lift down, though it takes several to put it on truck for the ship. He gave much talk to captain as to how and where his box is to be placed. But the captain like it not, and swear at him in many tongues, and tell him that if he like, he can come and see where it shall be. But he say no, that he come not yet, for that he have much to do. Whereupon the captain tell him that he had better be quick of his blood, for that his ship will leave the place of blood before the turn of tide, viz blood. Then the seaman smile and say that of course he must go when he think fit, but he will be surprised if he go quite so soon. The captain swear again, polyglot, and the seaman make him bow and thank him and say that he will so far intrude on his kindness as to come aboard before the sailing. Final, the captain more red than ever, and in more tongues tell him that he doesn't want no Frenchmen, with bloom upon them, and also with blood in his ship, with blood on her also. And so, after asking where he might purchase ship forms, he departed. No one knew where he went, or blooming well cared, as they said, for they had something else to think of. Well, this blood again, for it soon became apparent to all that the Tsarina Catherine would not sail, as was expected. A thin mist began to creep up from the river, and it grew and grew, till soon a dense fog enveloped the ship and all around her. The captain swore polyglot, very polyglot polyglot with bloom and blood, but he could do nothing. The water rose and rose, and he began to fear that he would lose the tide altogether. He was in no friendly mood when, just at full tide, the thin man came up the gangplank again and asked to see where his box had been stowed. Then the captain replied that he wished that he and his box 
Holt and his much bloom and blood were in hell. But the sin man did not be offended, and went down with the maid and saw where it was placed, and came up and stood a while on deck in fog. He must have come off by himself, for none noticed him. Indeed, they sought not of him, for soon the fog began to melt away, and all was clear again. My friends of the thirst and the language that was of bloom and blood laughed as they told how the captain's swears exceeded even his usual polyglot and was more than ever full of picturesque. When, on questioning other mariners who were on movement up and down the river that hour, he found that few of them had seen any of fog at all except where it lay around the wharf. However, the ship went out on the ebb tide and was doubtless by morning far down the river mouth. She was then, when they told us, well out to sea. And so, my dear Madame Mina, it is that we have to rest for a time, for our enemy is on the sea, with the fog at his command on his way to the Danube mouth. To sail a ship takes time, goes she never so quick, and when we start to go on land more quick, and we meet him there. Our best hope is to come on him when in the box between sunrise and sunset. Then he can make no struggle, and we may deal with him as we should. There are days for us in which we can make ready our plan. We know all about where he go, for we have seen the owner of the ship who have shown us invoices and all papers that can be. The box we seek is to be landed in Varna and to be given to an agent, one Ristich, who will there present his credentials. And so our merchant friend will have done his part. When he asks if there be any wrong, was that so he can telegraph and have inquiry made at Varna, we say no, no, for what is to be done is not for police or of the customs. It must be done by us alone and in our own way. When Dr. Van Helsing had done speaking, I asked him if he was certain that the Count had remained on board the ship. He replied, We have the best proof of that, your own evidence, when in the hypnotic trance this morning. I asked him again if it were really necessary that they should pursue the Count. But, oh, I dread Jonathan leaving me, and I know that he would surely go if the others went. He answered in growing passion, at first quietly. As he went on, however, he grew more angry and more forceful, till at the end, we could not but see wherein was at least some of that personal dominance which made him so long a master amongst men. Yes, it is necessary, 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 for your sake in the first and then for the sake of humanity. This monster has done much harm already. In the narrow scope where he finds himself and in the short time when as yet he was only as a body groping his so small measure in darkness and not knowing. All this have I told these others. You, my dear Madame Mina, will learn it in the phonograph of my friend John, or in that of your husband. I have told them how the measure of leaving his own barren land, barren of peoples, and coming to a new land where life of man teems till they are like the multitude of standing corn as a work of centuries. Were another of the undead like him to try to do what he has done, perhaps not all the centuries of the world that have been or that will be could aid him. Is this one, or oh, the forces of nature that are occult and deep and strong must have worked together in some wondrous way. The very place where he have had been alive, undead, 
for all these centuries is full of strangeness of the geologic and chemical world. There are deep caverns and fissures that reach none know whither. There have been volcanoes, some of whose openings still send out waters of strange properties and gases that kill or make to vivify. Doubtless, there is something magnetic or electric in some of these combinations of occult forces which work for physical life in strange way, and in himself bear from the first some great qualities. In a hard and warlike time, he was celebrate that he have more iron nerve, more subtle brain, more braver heart than any man. In him, some vital principle have in strange way found their utmost. And as his body keeps strong and grow and thrive, so his brain grow too. All this without that diabolic aid which is surely to him. For it have to yield to the powers that come from and are symbolic of good. And now this is what he is to us. He have infect you. Oh, forgive me, my dear, that I must say such, but it is for good of you that I speak. He infect you in such wise that even if he do no more, you have only to live, to live in your own old sweet way, and so in time, death, which is of man's common lot and with God's sanction, shall make you like to him. This must not be. We have sworn together that it must not. Thus, we are ministers of God's own wish, that the world and men for whom his son die will not be given over to monsters whose very existence would defame him, he hath allowed us to redeem one soul already, and we go out as the old knights of the cross to redeem more. Like them, we shall travel towards the sunrise, and like them, if we fall, we fall in good cause. He paused and I said, But will not the Count take his rebuff wisely? Since he has been driven from England, will he not avoid it as a tiger does the village from which he has been hunted? Aha, uh -huh, he said, your simile of the tiger good for me, but I shall adopt him. Your man-eater, as they of India call the tiger who has once tasted the blood of the human, care no more for the other prey, but prowl unceasing till he get him. This that we hunt from our village is a tiger too, a man-eater, and he never cease to prowl. Nay, in himself he is not one to retire and stay afar. In his life, his living life, he go over the Turkey frontier and attack his enemy on his own ground. He be bitten back, but did he stay? No, he come again and again and again. Look at his persistence and endurance. With the child brain that was to him, he have long since conceived the idea of coming to a great city. What does he do? We find out the place of all the world most of promise for him. Then he deliberately set himself down to prepare for the task. He find in patience just how is his strength and what are his powers. He study new tongues. He learn new social life, new environment of old ways. The politics, the law, the finance, the science, the habit of a new land and a new people who have come to be since he was. His glimpse that he have had wet his appetite only and in keen his desire. Nay, it help him to grow as to his brain, for it all proved to him how right he was at the first in his surmises. He have done this alone all alone, from a ruined tomb in a forgotten land. 
wordt moor mee hij not doe, when the greater world of thought is open to him. He that can smile at death as we know him, who can flourish in the midst of diseases that kill off whole peoples. Oh, if such a one was to come from God and not the devil, what a force for good might he not be in this old world of ours. But we are pledged to set the world free. Our toil must be in silence, and our efforts all in secret. For in this enlightened age, when men believe not even what they see, the doubting of wise men would be his greatest strength. It would be at once his sheath and his armor, and his weapons to destroy us, his enemies, who are willing to peril even our own souls for the safety of one we love. For the good of mankind, and for the honor and the glory of God. After a general discussion, it was determined that for tonight nothing be definitely settled, and that we should all sleep on the facts and try to think out the proper conclusions. Tomorrow at breakfast we are to meet again, and after making our conclusions known to one another, we shall decide on some definite cause of action. I feel a wonderful peace and rest tonight. It is as if some haunting presence were removed from me. Perhaps. My surmise was not finished, could not be, for I caught sight in the mirror of the red mark upon my forehead, and I knew that I was still unclean. Dr. Seward's Diary, 5th of October We all rose early, and I think that sleep did much for each and all of us. When we met at early breakfast, there was more general cheerfulness than any of us had expected to experience again. It is really wonderful how much resilience there is in human nature. Let any obstructing cause, no matter what, be removed in any way, even by death, and we fly back to first principles of hope and enjoyment. More than once as we sat around the table, my eyes opened in wonder whether the whole of the past days had not been a dream. It was only when I caught sight of the red blotch on Mrs. Harker's forehead that I was brought back to reality. Even now, when I am gravely revolving the matter, it's almost impossible to realize that the cause of all our trouble is still existent. Even Mrs. Harker seems to lose sight of her trouble for whole spells. It's only now and again, when something recalls it to her mind, she thinks of her terrible scar. We are to meet here in my study in half an hour and decide on our course of action. I see only one immediate difficulty. I know it by instinct rather than reason. We shall all have to speak frankly, and yet I fear that in some mysterious way poor Mrs. Harker's tongue is tied. I know that she forms conclusions of her own, and from all that has been, I can guess how brilliant and how true they must be. But she will not, or cannot, give them utterance. I have mentioned this to Van Helsing, and he and I are to talk it over when we're alone. I suppose it is some of that horrid poison which has got into her veins beginning to work. The Count had his own purposes when he gave her what Van Helsing called her the vampire's baptism of blood. Well, there may be a poison that distills itself out of good things. In an age where the existence of Tomaines is a mystery, we should not wonder at anything. One thing I do know, that if my instinct be true regarding poor Mrs. Harker's silences, then there is a terrible difficulty, an unknown danger in the work before us. The same power that compels her silence may compel her speech. I dare not think further, for so I should in my thoughts dishonor a noble woman. Later, when the professor came in, we talked over the state of things. I could see that he had something on his mind which he wanted to say, but felt some hesitancy about broaching the subject. After beating about the bush a little, he said, Friend John, there is something that you and I must talk of alone. Just as the first at any rate. Later we may have to take the others into our confidence. Then he stopped. So I waited. He went on. Madame Mina, 
Our poor, dear Madame Mina is changing. A cold shiver ran through me to find my worst fears thus endorsed. Van Helsing continued. This sad experience of Miss Lucy, we must at this time be warned before things go too far. Our task is now in reality more difficult than ever, and this new trouble makes every hour of the direst importance. I can see the characteristics of the vampire coming in her face. It is now but very, very slight, but it is to be seen if we have eyes to notice without prejudge. Her teeth are sharper, and at times her eyes are more hard. But these are not all. There is to her the silence now often, as so it was with Miss Lucy. She did not speak even when she wrote that which she wished to be known later. Now my fear is this. If it be that she can, by our hypnotic trance, tell what the Count see and hear, is it not more true that he who have hypnotized her first and who have drink of her very blood and make her drink of his should, if he will, compel her mind to disclose to him that which she know? I nodded acquiescence. He went on. Then, what we must do is to prevent this. We must keep her ignorant of our intent, and so she cannot tell what she know not. This is a painful task, oh, so painful that it heartbreak me to think of it, but it must be. When today we meet, I must tell her that for reason which we will not to speak, she must not more be of our counsel, but be simply guarded by us. He wiped his forehead, which had broken out in profuse perspiration at the thought of the pain which he might have to inflict upon the poor soul already so tortured. I knew that it would be some sort of comfort to him if I told him that I had also come to the same conclusion, for, at any rate, it would take away the pain of doubt. I told him, and the effect was as I expected. It is now close to the time of our general gathering. Van Helsing has gone away to prepare for the meeting and his painful part of it. I really believe his purpose is to be able to pray alone. Later, at the very outset of our meeting, a great personal relief was experienced by both Van Helsing and myself. Mrs. Harker had sent a message by her husband to say that she would not join us at present, as she thought it better that we should be free to discuss our movements without her presence to embarrass us. The professor and I looked at each other for an instant, and somehow we both seemed relieved. For my own part, I thought that if Mrs. Harker realised the danger herself, it was much pain as well as much danger averted. Under the circumstances, we agreed by a questioning look and answer with a finger on lip to preserve silence in our suspicions until we should have been able to confer alone again. We went at once into our plan of campaign. Van Helsing roughly put the facts before us. The Tsarina Catherine left the Thames yesterday morning. It will take her at the quickest speed she has ever made at least three weeks to reach Varna. But we can travel overland by the same place in three days. Now, if we allow for two days less for the ship's voyage owing to such weather influences as we know that the Count can bring to bear, and if we allow a whole day and night for any delays which may occur to us, then we have a margin of nearly two weeks. Thus, in order to be quite safe, we must leave here on 17th at latest. Then we shall at any rate be in Varna a day before the ship arrives, and able to make such preparations as may be necessary. Of course, we shall all go armed armed against evil things, spiritual as well as physical. Here Quincy Morris added, I understand that the Count comes from a wolf country, and it may be that he shall get there before us. I propose that we add Winchesters to our armament. I have a kind of belief in a Winchester when there's any trouble of that sort around. Do you remember, Art, when we had the pack after us at Tobolsk, 
What wouldn't we have given then for a repeater apiece? Good, said Van Helsing. Winchester's it shall be. Quincy's head is level at times, but most so when there is to hunt. Metaphor, be more dishonor to science and wolves be a danger to man. In the meantime, we can do nothing here. And as I think that Varna is not familiar to any of us, why not go there more soon? It is as long to wait here as there. Tonight and tomorrow we can get ready, and then, if all be well, we four can set out on our journey. We four, said Harker interrogatively, looking from one to another of us. Of course, answered the professor quickly, you must remain to take care of your so sweet wife. Harker was silent for a while, and then said in a hollow voice, Let's talk of that part in the morning. I want to consult with Mina. I thought that now was the time for Van Helsing to warn him not to disclose our plan to her, but he took no notice. I looked at him significantly and coughed. For answer, he put his finger to his lips and turned away. Jonathan Harker's Journal October afternoon For some time after our meeting this morning, I couldn't think. The new phases of things leave my mind in a state of wonder which allows no room for active thought. Mina's determination not to take any part in the discussion set me thinking. And, as I couldn't argue the matter with her, I could only guess. I am as far forever from a solution now. The way the others received it, too, puzzled me. The last time we talked of the subject, we agreed that there was to be no more concealment of anything amongst us. Mina is sleeping now, calmly and sweetly like a little child. Her lips are curved and her face beams with happiness. Thank God there are still such moments for her. Later. How strange it all is. I sat watching Mina's happy sleep, and I came as near to being happy myself as I suppose I shall ever be. As the evening drew on, and the earth took its shadows from the sun sinking lower, the silence of the room grew more and more solemn to me. All at once, Mina opened her eyes and, looking at me tenderly, said, Jonathan, I want you to promise me something on your word of honour, a promise made to me but made holy in God's hearing, and not to be broken, though I should go down on my knees and implore you with bitter tears. Quick, you must make it to me at once. Mina, I said, a promise like that, I can't make at once. I may have no right to make it with such spiritual intensity that her eyes are like pole stars. It is I who wish it, and it is not for myself. You can ask Dr. Van Helsing if I'm not right. If he disagrees, you may do as you will. Nay, more, if you all agree. Later, you're absolved from the promise. I promise, I said, and for a moment she looked supremely happy, though to me, all happiness for her was denied by the red scar on her forehead. She said, Promise me that you won't tell me anything of the plans formed for the campaign against the Count, not by word or inference or implication, not at any time, whilst this remains to me. And she solemnly pointed to the scar. I saw that she was in earnest and said solemnly, I promise. And as I said it, I felt that from that instant, the door had been shut between us. Later, midnight. Mina has been bright and cheerful all the evening, so much so that all the rest seem to take courage as if infected somewhat with her gaiety. As a result, even I myself felt as if the pall of gloom which weighs us down was somewhat lifted. We all retired early. Mina is now sleeping like a little child. It's a wonderful thing that her faculty of sleep remains to her in the midst of her terrible trouble. Thank God for it, for then at least she can forget her care. Perhaps her example may affect me, as her gaiety did tonight. I shall try it. Oh, for a dreamless sleep. 6th of October morning. Another surprise. Mina woke me early, about the same time as yesterday, and asked me to bring Dr. Van Helsing. I thought that it was another occasion for hypnotism, and without question went for the professor. He had evidently expected some such call, for I found him dressed in his room. His door was ajar so that he could hear the opening of the door of our room. 
He came at once. As he passed into the room, he asked Mina if the others might come too. No, she said quite simply. It, it will not be necessary. You can tell them just as well. I must go with you on your journey. Dr. Van Helsing was as startled as I was. After a moment's pause, he asked, But why? You must take me with you. I am safer with you. And you shall be safer too. But why, dear Madame Mina? You know that your safety is our solemnest duty. We go into danger to which you are or may be more liable than any of us from, from circumstances, things that have been. He paused, embarrassed. As she replied, she raised her finger and pointed to her forehead. I know. That is why I must go. I can tell you now, whilst the sun is coming up, I may not be able to again. I know that when the Count wills me, I must go. I know that if he tells me to come in secret, I must, by while, by any device to hoodwink, even Jonathan. God saw the look that she turned on me as she spoke, and if there indeed be a recording angel, that look is noted to her everlasting honour. I could only clasp her hand. I could not speak. My emotion was too great for even the relief of tears. She went on. You men are brave and strong. You are strong in your numbers, for you can defy that which would break down the human endurance of one who had to guard alone. Besides, I may be of service, since you can hypnotize me, and so learn that which even I myself do not know. Dr. Van Helsing said gravely, Madame Mina, you are as always most wise. You shall with us come, and together we shall do that which we go forth to achieve. When he had spoken, Mina's long spell of silence made me look at her. She had fallen back on her pillow asleep. She did not even wake when I had pulled up the blind and let in the sunlight which flooded the room. Van Helsing motioned to me to come with him quietly. We went to his room, and within a minute Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, and Mr. Morris were with us also. He told them what Mina had said and went on. In the morning we shall leave for Varna. We have now to deal with a new factor, Madame Mina. Oh, but her soul is true. It is to her an agony to tell us so much as she has done. But it is most right, and we are warned in time. There must be no chance lost, and in Varna we must be ready to act the instant when that ship arrives. What shall we do exactly? asked Mr. Morris laconically. The professor paused before replying, We sail at the first board that ship. Then, when we have identified the box, we shall place a branch of the wild rose on it. This we shall fasten. For when it is there, none can emerge. So that at least says the superstition. And to superstition we must trust at the first. It was man's face in the early and it have its root in faith still. Then, when we get the opportunities that we seek, when none are near to see, we shall open the box, and... and all will be well. I shall not wait for any opportunity, said Morris. When I see the box, I shall open it and destroy the monster, though there were a thousand men looking on. And if I am to be wiped out for it the next moment, I grasped his hand instinctively, and found it as firm as a piece of steel. I think he understood my look. I hope he did. Good boy, said Dr. Van Helsing. Brave boy. Quincy is all man. God bless him for it. My child, believe me, none of us shall lag behind or pause from any fear. I do but say what we may do, what we must do. But indeed, indeed, we cannot say what we may do. There are so many things which may happen, and their ways and their ends are so various that until the moment we may not say, we shall all be armed in all ways, and when the time for the end has come, our effort shall not be lack. Now, let us today put all our affairs in order. Let all things which touch on others dear to us, and who on us depend, be complete. 
for none of us can tell what, or when, or how the end may be. As for me, my own affairs are regulate, and as I have nothing else to do, I shall go make arrangements for the travel. I shall have all tickets and so forth for our journey. There was nothing further to be said, and we parted. I shall now settle up all my affairs of earth and be ready for whatever may come. Later, it is done. My will is made and all complete. Mina, if she survive, is my sole heir. If it should not be so, then the others who have been so good to us shall have remainder. It is now drawing towards the sunset. Mina's uneasiness calls my attention to it. I am sure that there is something on her mind which the time of exact sunset will reveal. These occasions are becoming harrowing times for us all, for each sunrise and sunset opens up some new danger, some new pain, which, however, may in God's will be means to a good end. I write all these things in the diary, since my darling must not hear them now, but if it may be that she can see them again, they shall be ready. She's calling to me. Chapter 25 Dr. Seward's Diary 11th of October, evening Jonathan Harker has asked me to note this, as he says he is hardly equal to the task and he wants an exact record kept. I think that none of us were surprised when we were asked to see Mrs. Harker a little before the time of sunset. We have of late come to understand that sunrise and sunset are to her times of peculiar freedom, when her old self can be manifest without any controlling force subduing or restraining her or inciting her to action. This mood or condition begins some half hour or more before actual sunrise or sunset and lasts till either the sun is high or whilst the clouds are still aglow with the rays streaming above the horizon. At first there is a sort of negative condition, as if some tie were loosened, and then the absolute freedom quickly follows. When, however, the freedom ceases, the change back or relapse comes quickly, preceded only by a spell of warning silence. Tonight, when we met, she was somewhat constrained and bore all the signs of an internal struggle. I put it down myself to her making a violent effort at the earliest instant she could do so. A very few minutes, however, gave her complete control of herself. Then, motioning her husband to sit beside her on the sofa where she was half reclining, she made the rest of us bring chairs up close. Taking her husband's hand in hers, she began, We are all here together in freedom. For perhaps the last time, I know that you will always be with me to the end. This was to her husband, whose hand, as we could see, tightened upon her. In the morning, we go out upon our task, and God alone knows what might be in store for any of us. You are going to be so good to me to take me with you. I know that all that brave, earnest men can do for a poor, weak woman, whose soul perhaps is lost, no, no, not yet, but is at any rate at stake, you will do. But you must remember that I am not as you are. There is a poison in my blood, in my soul, which may destroy me, which must destroy me, unless some relief comes to us. Oh, my friends, you know as well as I do that my soul is at stake, and though I know there is one way out for me, you must not, and I must not take it. She looked appealingly to us all in turn, beginning and ending with her husband. What is that way which we must not, may not take? Then I may die now, either by my own hand or that of another, before the greater evil is entirely wrought. I know, and you know, that were I once dead, you could and would set free my immortal spirit, even as you did my poor Lucy's. Were death or the fear of death the only thing that stood in the way, I would not shrink to die here now, amidst the friends who love me. But death is not all. I cannot believe that to die in such a case, when there is hope before us and a bitter task to be done, is God's will. Therefore, I, on my part, 
give up here the certainty of eternal rest, and go out into the dark, where may be the blackest things that the world or the netherworld holds. We were all silent, for we knew instinctively that this was only a prelude. The faces of the others were set, and Harker's grew ashen grey. Perhaps he guessed better than any of us what was coming. She continued, This is what I can give into the hotchpot. I could not but note the quaint legal phrase which she used in such a place, and with all seriousness. What will each of you give? Your lives, I know, she went on quickly. That is easy for brave men. Your lives are God's, and you can give them back to him. But what will you give to me? She looked again questioningly, but this time avoided her husband's face. Quincy seemed to understand. He nodded, and her face lit up. Then I shall tell you plainly what I want, for there must be no doubtful matter in this connection between us now. You must promise me one and all, even you, my beloved husband, that should the time come, you will kill me. What is that time? The voice was Quincy's, but it was low and strained. When you shall be convinced that I am so changed that it is better that I die, that I may live, when I am thus dead in the flesh, then you will, without a moment's delay, drive a stake through me and cut off my head and do whatever else may be wanting to give me rest. Quincy was the first to rise after the pause. He knelt down before her and, taking her hand in his, said solemnly, I'm only a rough fellow who hasn't, perhaps, lived as a man should to win such a distinction. But I swear to you, by all that I hold sacred and dear, that should the time ever come, I shall not flinch from the duty that you have set us. And I promise you, too, that I shall make all certain, for if I am only doubtful, I shall take it that the time has come. My true friend was all she could say amid her fast-falling tears as bending over. She kissed his hand. I swear the same, my dear Madam Mina, said Van Helsing. And I, said Lord Godalming, each of them in turn kneeling to her to take the oath. I followed myself. Then her husband turned to her, one-eyed and with a greenish pallor, which subdued the snowy whiteness of his hair, and asked, And must I too make such a promise, though my wife? You too, my dearest she said with infinite yearning of pity in her voice and eyes. You must not shrink. You are nearest and dearest in all the world to me. Our souls are knit into one for all life and all time. Think, dear, that there have been times when brave men have killed their wives and their womankind to keep them from falling into the hands of the enemy. Their hands did not falter any the more because those that they loved implored them to slay them. It is men's duty towards those whom they love in such times of sore trial. And, oh, my dear, if it is to be that I must meet death at any hand, let it be at the hand of him that loves me best. Dr. Van Helsing, I have not forgotten your mercy in poor Lucy's case to him who loved. She stopped with a flying blush and changed her phrase. To him who had best right to give her peace. If that time shall come again, I look to you to make it a happy memory of my husband's life, that it was his loving hand which set me free from the awful thrall upon me. Again, I swear, came the professor's resonant voice. Mrs. Harker smiled, positively smiled, as with a sigh of relief she leaned back and said, And now, one word of warning. A warning which you must never forget. This time, if it ever come, may come quickly and unexpectedly, and in such case you must lose no time in using your opportunity. At such a time I myself might be, nay, if the time ever come, shall be leagued with your enemy against you. One more request. She became very solemn as she said this. It is not vital and necessary like the other, but I want you to do one thing for me if you will. We all acquiesced, but no one spoke. There was no need to speak. I want you to read the burial service. She was interrupted by a deep groan from her husband. Taking his hand in hers, she held it over her heart and continued, 
you must read it over me some day. Whatever may be the issue of all this fearful state of things, it will be a sweet thought to all or some of us. You, my dearest, will, I hope, read it, for then it will be in your voice and my memory for ever, come what may. But, but, oh, my dear one, he pleaded, death is far away from you. Nay, she said, holding up a warning hand. I am deeper in death at this moment than if the weight of an earthly grave lay heavy upon me. Oh, my wife, must I read it? he said before he began. It would comfort me, my husband, was all she said, and he began to read when she had got the book ready. How can I, how could anyone tell of that strange scene? Its solemnity, its gloom, its sadness, its horror, and withal, its sweetness. Even a sceptic who can see nothing but a travesty of bitter truth in anything holy or emotional would have been melted to the heart had he seen that little group of loving and devoted friends kneeling round that stricken and sorrowing lady, or heard the tender passion of her husband's voice as in tones so broken and emotional that often he had to pause. He read the simple and beautiful service from the burial of the dead. I cannot go on. Words and voices fail me. She was right in her instinct, strange as it was, bizarre as it may hereafter seem, even to us who felt its potent influence at the time. It comforted us much, and the silence which showed Mrs. Harker's coming relapse from her freedom of the soul, did not seem so full of despair to any of us as we had dreaded. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 15th of October, Varna We left Charing Cross on the morning of the 12th, got to Paris the same night, and took the places secured for us in the Orient Express. We travelled night and day, arriving here about five o'clock, Lord Godalming went to the consulate to see if any telegram had arrived for him, whilst the rest of us came on to his hotel, the Odysseus. The journey may have had incidents, I was, however, too eager to get on to care for them. Until the Tsarina Catherine comes into port, there will be no interest for me in anything in the wide world. Thank God Mina is well, and looks to be getting stronger. Her colour is coming back. She sleeps a great deal. Throughout the journey she slept nearly all the time. Before sunrise and sunset, however, she is very wakeful and alert, and it has become a habit for Van Helsing to hypnotise her at such times. At first uh, some effort was needed, and he had to make many passes, but now she seems to yield at once, as if by habit, and scarcely any action is needed. He seems to have power at these particular moments to simply will, and her thoughts obey him. He always asks her what she can see and hear. She answers to the first, nothing, all is dark, and to the second, I can hear the waves lapping against the ship and the water rushing by. Canvas and cordage strain, and masts and yards creak. The wind is high, I can hear it in the shrouds, and the bow throws back the foam. It's evident that the Tsarina Catherine is still at sea hastening on her way to Varna. Lord Godalming has just returned. He had four telegrams, one each day since we started, and all to the same effect, that the Tsarina Catherine had not been reported to Lloyd's from anywhere. He had arranged before leaving London that his agent should send him every day a telegram saying if the ship had been reported. He was to have a message, even if she were not reported, so that he might be sure that there was a watch being kept at the other end of the wire. We had dinner and went to bed early. Tomorrow we are to see the vice-consul and to arrange, if we can, about getting on board the ship as soon as she arrives. Van Helsing says that our chance will be to get on the boat between sunrise and sunset. The Count, even if he takes the form of a bat, cannot cross the running water of his own volition and so cannot leave the ship as he dare not change the man's form without suspicion, which he evidently wishes to avoid, he must remain in the box. If, then, we can come on board after sunrise, he is at our mercy, for we can open the box and make sure of him, as we did of poor Lucy, before he wakes.
What mercy he shall get from us all will not count for much. We think that we shall not have much trouble with officials or the seamen. Thank God this is a country where bribery can do anything, and we are well supplied with money. We have only to make sure that the ship cannot come into port between sunset and sunrise without our being warned, and we shall be safe. Judge Moneybag will settle this case, I think. 16th of October. Mina's report still the same. Lapping waves and rushing water, darkness and favouring winds. We are evidently in good time, and when we hear of the Tsarina Catherine, we shall be ready. As she must pass the Dardanelles, we are sure to have some report. 17th of October. Everything's pretty well fixed now, I think, to welcome the Count on his return from his tour. Godalming told the shippers that he fancied that the box sent abroad might contain something stolen from a friend of his, and got a half consent that he might open it at his own risk. The owner gave him a paper, telling the captain to give him every facility in doing whatever he chose on board the ship, and also a similar authorization to his agent at Varna. We have seen the agent who was much impressed with Godoming's kindly manner to him, and we are all satisfied that whatever he can do to aid our wishes will be done. We have already arranged what to do in case we get the box open. If the Count's there, Van Helsing and Seward will cut off his head at once and drive a stake through his heart. Morris and Godalming and I shall prevent interference, even if we have to use the arms which we shall have ready. The Professor says that if we can so treat the Count's body, it will soon after fall into dust. In such case there will be no evidence against us in case any suspicion of murder were aroused. But even if it were not, we should stand or fall by our act, and perhaps some day this very script may be evidence to come between some of us and a rope. For myself, I should take the chance only too thankfully if it were to come. We mean to leave no stone unturned to carry out our intent. We have arranged with certain officials that the instant the Tsarina Catherine is seen, we are to be informed by a special messenger. 24th of October. A whole week of waiting. Daily telegrams to Godalming, but only the same story, not yet reported. Mina's morning and evening hypnotic answer is unvaried. Lapping waves, rushing water, and creaking masts. Telegram, October 24th. Rufus Smith, Lloyds, London, to Lord Godalming, care of HBM Vice Consul, Varna. Sarina Catherine reported this morning from Dardanelles. Dr. Seward's diary, 25th of October. How I miss my phonograph. To write a diary with a pen is irksome to me, but Van Helsing says I must. We were all wild with excitement yesterday when Godalming got his telegram from Lloyd's. I know now what men feel in battle when the call to action is heard. Mrs. Harker, alone of our party, did not show any signs of emotion. After all, it is not strange that she did not, for we took special care not to let her know anything about it, and we all tried not to show any excitement when we were in her presence. In old days she would, I am sure, have noticed, no matter how we might have tried to conceal it. But in this way she is greatly changed during the past three weeks. The lethargy grows upon her. And though she seems strong and well, and is getting back some of her colour, Van Helsing and I are not satisfied. We talk of her often. We have not, however, said a word to the others. It would break poor Harker's heart, certainly his nerve, if he knew that we had even a suspicion on the subject. Van Helsing examines, he tells me, her teeth very carefully, while she is in hypnotic condition for he says that so long as they do not begin to sharpen, there is no active danger of a change in her. If this change should come, it would be necessary to take steps. We both know what those steps would have to be, though we do not mention our thoughts to each other. We should neither of us shrink from the task, awful though it be to contemplate. Euthanasia is an excellent and a comforting word. I'm grateful to whoever invented it. It is only about twenty-four hours' sail from the Dardanelles to here at the rate that Tsarina Catherine has come from London. 
She should therefore arrive some time in the morning, but as she cannot possibly get in before noon, we are all about to retire early. We shall get up at one o'clock, so as to be ready. 25th of October, noon. No news yet of the ship's arrival. Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report this morning was the same as usual, so it is possible that we may get news at any moment. We men are all in a fever of excitement, except Harker, who is calm. His hands are cold as ice, and an hour ago I found him wetting the edge of the great Gorka knife which he now always carries with him. It will be a bad lookout for the Count if the edge of that cookery ever touches his throat, driven by that stern, ice-cold hand. Van Helsing and I were a little alarmed about Mrs. Harker today. About noon, she got into a sort of lethargy which we didn't like. Although we kept silence to the others, we were neither of us happy about it. She had been restless all the morning, so that we were at first glad to know that she was sleeping. When, however, her husband mentioned casually that she was sleeping so soundly that he couldn't wake her, we went to her room to see for ourselves. She was breathing naturally and looked so well and peaceful that we agreed that the sleep was better for her than anything else. Poor girl. She has so much to forget that it's no wonder that sleep, if it brings oblivion to her, does her good. Later, our opinion was justified. For when, after a refreshing sleep of some hours, she woke up, she seemed brighter and better than she had been for days. At sunset she made the usual hypnotic report. Wherever he may be in the Black Sea, the Count is hurrying to his destination. To his doom, I trust. 26th of October Another day and no tidings of the Tsarina Catherine. She ought to be here by now. That she is still journeying somewhere is apparent, for Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report at sunrise was still the same. It's possible that the vessel may be lying by at times for fog. Some of the steamers which came in last evening reported patches of fog both to north and south of the port. We must continue our watching, as the ship may now be signalled any moment. 27th of October, noon. Most strange. No news yet of the ship we wait for. Mrs. Harker reported last night and this morning, as usual, lapping waves and rushing water, though she added that the waves were very faint. The telegrams from London have been the same. No further report. Van Helsing is terribly anxious and told me just now that he fears the Count is escaping us. He added significantly, I did not like that lethargy of Madame Minas. Souls and memories can do strange things during trance. I was about to ask him more, but Harker just then came in, and he held up a warning hand. We must try tonight at sunset to make her speak more fully when in her hypnotic state. 28th of October. Telegram. Rufus Smith. London. To Lord Godalming. Care HBM Vice Consul Varna. Sarina Catherine reported entering Galatz at one o'clock today. Dr. Seward's Diary 28th of October When the telegram came announcing the arrival in Galatz, I do not think it was such a shock to any of us as might have been expected. True, we didn't know whence or how or when the bolt would come. But I think we all expected that something strange would happen. The day of arrival at Varna made us individually satisfied that things would not be just as we had expected. We only waited to learn where the change would occur. Nonetheless, however, it was a surprise. I suppose that nature works on such a hopeful basis that we believe against ourselves that things will be as they ought to be, not as we should know that they will be. Transcendentalism is a beacon to the angels, even if it be a will-o'-the-wisp to man. And Helsing raised his hand over his head for a moment as though in remonstrance with the Almighty, but he said not a word, and in a few seconds stood up with his face sternly set. Lord Godalming grew very pale and sat breathing heavily. I was myself half stunned and looked in wonder at one after another. Quincy Morris tightened his belt with that quick movement which I knew so well. In our old wandering days it meant action. Mrs. Harker grew ghastly white, so that the scar on her forehead seemed to burn. 
but she folded her hands meekly and looked up in prayer. Harker smiled, actually smiled, the dark, bitter smile of one who is without hope. But at the same time, his action belied his words, for his hands instinctively sought the hilt of the great cookery knife and rested there. When does the next train start for Galatz? said Van Helsing to us generally. At 6.30 tomorrow morning, we all started, for the answer came from Mrs. Harker. How on earth do you know? said Art. You forget, or perhaps you do not know, though Jonathan does and so does Dr. Van Helsing, that I am a train fiend. At home in Exeter, I always used to make up the timetables so as to be helpful to my husband. I found it so useful sometimes that I always make a study of the timetables now. I knew that if anything were to take us to Castle Dracula, we should go by Galatz, or at any rate through Bucharest, so I learned the times very carefully. Unhappily, there are not many to learn, as the only train tomorrow leaves, as I say. Wonderful woman, murmured the professor. Can't we get a special? asked Lord Godalming. Van Helsing shook his head. I fear not. This land is very different from yours or mine. Even if we did have a special, it would probably not arrive as soon as our regular train. Moreover, we have something to prepare. We must think now. Let us organize. You, friend Arthur, go to the train and get the tickets and arrange that all be ready for us to go in the morning. Do you, friend Jonathan, go to the agent of the ship and get from him letters to the agent in Galatz, his authority to make a search of the ship just as it was here. Quincy Morris, you see the vice consul and get his aid with his fellow in Galatz, all he can do to make our way smooth so that no times be lost when over the Danube. John, this David, Madame Mina, and me, and we shall consult. For so, if time be long, you may be delayed, and it will not matter when the sun set, since I am here with Madame to make report. And I, said Mrs. Harker brightly, and more like her old self than she had been for many a long day, shall try to be of use in all ways, and shall think and write for you, as I used to do. Something is shifting from me in some strange way, and I feel freer than I have been of late. The three younger men looked happier at the moment as they seemed to realise the significance of her words, but Van Helsing and I, turning to each other, met each a grave and troubled glance. We said nothing at the time, however. When the three men had gone out to their tasks, Van Helsing asked Mrs. Harker to look up the copy of the diaries and find him the part of Harker's journal at the castle. She went away to get it. When the door was shut upon her, he said to me, Be means the same. Speak out. Here is some change. It's a hope that makes me sick, for it may deceive us. Quite so. Do you know why I asked her to get the manuscript? No, said I, unless it was to get an opportunity of seeing me alone. You are right in part, friend John, but only in part. I want to tell you something, and all my friends, I am taking a great, a terrible risk. In the moment when Madame Mina said those words that arrest both our understanding, an inspiration came to me. In the trance of three days ago, the Count sent her his spirit to read her mind. Or more like he took her to see him in his earth box in the ship with water rushing, just as it go free at rise and set of sun. He learns then that we are here, for she have more to tell in her open life with eyes to see, ears to hear, than he, shut as he is, in his coffin box. Now, he make his most effort to escape us. At present, he want her not. He is sure of his so great knowledge that she will come at his call. But he cut her off, take her as he can do out of his own power, that so she come not to him. Ah, there I have hopes that our man brains that have been of man so long and that have not lost the grace of God will come higher than his child brain that lie in his tomb for centuries that grow not yet to our stature and that do only work selfish and therefore small. Here comes Madame Mina, not a word to her of her trance. She knows it not and it would overwhelm her and make despair just when we want all her hope. 
all her courage, when most we want all her great brain, which is trained like a man's brain, but is of sweet woman, and have a special power which the Count give her, and which he may not take away altogether, though he think not so. Hush, let me speak, and you shall learn, O oh John, my friend. We are in awful straits. I fear as I never feared before. We can only trust the good God. Silence. Here she comes. I thought that the professor was going to break down and have hysterics, just as he had when Lucy died, but with a great effort he controlled himself and was at a perfect nervous poise when Mrs. Harker tripped into the room, bright and happy-looking, and in the doing of work seemingly forgetful of her misery. As she came in, she handed a number of sheets of typewriting to Van Helsing. He looked over them gravely, his face brightening up as he read. Then, holding the pages between his finger and thumb, he said, Friend John, to you with so much experience already, and you too, dear Madame Mina, that are young, here is a lesson. Do not fear ever to think. A half-thought has been buzzing often in my brain, but I fear to let him lose his wings. Here now, this more knowledge, I go back to where that half-thought come from, and I find that he be no half-thought at all, that be a whole thought, though so young that he is not yet strong to use his little wings. Nay, like the ugly duck of my friend Hans Andersen, he be no duck thought at all, but a big swan thought that sail nobly on big wings, when the time come for him to try them. See, I read here what Jonathan have written. That other of his race who at a later age again and again brought his forces over the great river into Turkey land, who, when he was beaten back, came again and again and again, though he had to come alone from the bloody field where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone would ultimately triumph. What does this tell us? Not much, no. The Count's child's heart see nothing. Therefore, he speaks so free. Your man's sort see nothing. My man's sort see nothing. Till just now, no, but there comes another word from someone who speak without thought, because she too know not what it mean, what it might mean. Just as there are elements which rest, yet when in nature's course they move on their way and they touch the poof, and there comes a flash of light, heaven wide, that blind and kill and destroy some but that show up all earths below for leagues and leagues. Is it not so? Well, I shall explain. To begin, a few ever study the philosophy of crime? Yes and no. You, John? Yes, for it is a study of insanity. You know, Madame Mina, for crime touch you not, not but once. Still, your mind works through and argues not a particulari ad universale. There is this peculiarity in criminals. It is so constant in all countries and at all times that even police, who know not much from philosophy, came to know it empirically, that it is to be empiric. The criminal always work at one crime. That is a true criminal who seems predestinate to crime and who will of none other. This criminal has not full man brain. He is clever and cunning and resourceful, but he be not of man stature as to brain. He be of child brain in much. Now, this criminal of ours is predestinate to crime also. He too have child brain, and it is of the child to do what he hath done. The little bird, the little fish, 
the little animal learn not by principle, but empirically. And when he learn to do, then there is to him the ground to start from to do more. Dos pusto, said Archimedes, give me a fulcrum and I shall move the world. To do once is a fulcrum whereby child brain become man brain. And until he have the purpose to do more, he continue to do the same again every time, just as he have done before. Oh, my dear, I see that your eyes are opened and that to you the lightning flash show all the leagues. For Mrs. Harker began to clap her hands and her eyes sparkled. He went on, now you shall speak. Tell us two dry men of science what you see with those so bright eyes. He took her hand and held it whilst he spoke, his finger and thumb close on her pulse, as I thought instinctively and unconsciously as she spoke. The Count is a criminal and of criminal type. Nordo and Lombroso would so classify him, and qua criminal he is of an imperfectly formed mind. Thus, in a difficulty, he has to seek resource in habit. His past is a clue, and the one page of it that we know, and that from his own lips tells us that once before, when in what Mr. Morris would call a tight place, he went back to his own country, from the land he had tried to invade, and thence, without losing purpose, prepared himself for a new effort. He came again, better equipped for his work, and won. So he came to London to invade a new land. He was beaten, and when all hope of success was lost and his existence in danger, he fled back over the sea to his home, just as formerly he had fled back over the Danube from Turkey land. Good, good, are oh, you so clever, lady, said Van Helsing enthusiastically, as he stooped and kissed her hand. A moment later he said to me, as calmly as though we had been having a sick-room consultation, Seventy-two only, and in all this excitement, I have hope. Turning to her again, he said with keen expectation, But go on, go on, there is more to tell, if you will. Be not afraid. John and I know, I do in any case, and I shall tell you if you are right. Speak without fear. I will try to, but you'll forgive me if I seem too egotistical. Nay, fear not, you must be egotist, for it is of you that we think. Then, as he is criminal, he is selfish, and as his intellect is small and his action is based on selfishness, he confines himself to one purpose. That purpose is remorseless, and he fled back over the Danube, leaving his forces to be cut to pieces. So now he is intent on being safe, careless of all. So his own selfishness frees my soul somewhat from the terrible power which he acquired over me on that dreadful night. I felt it. Oh, I felt it. Thank God for his great mercy. My soul is freer than it has been since that awful hour. And all that haunts me is a fear lest in some trance or dream he may have used my knowledge for his ends. The professor stood up. He has so used your mind and by it he has left us here in Varna, whilst the ship that carried him rushed through enveloping fog up to Galatz, where, doubtless, he had made preparation for escaping from us. But his child mind only saw so far, and it may be that as ever is in God's providence the very thing that the evildoer most reckoned on for his selfish good turns out to be his chiefest harm. The hunter is taken in his own snare, as the great psalmist says, for now that he thinks he is free from every trace of us all, and that he has escaped as with so many hours to him, then his selfish child brain will whisper him to sleep. He thinks too that as he cut himself off from knowing your minds, there can be no knowledge of him to you. There is very fail. That terrible baptism of blood which he give you makes you free to go to him in spirit, 
as you have as yet done in your times of freedom, bends the sun rise and set. At such times you go by my volition and not by his, and this power to good you and others you have won from your suffering at his hands. This is now all more precious that he know it not, and to guard himself hath even cut himself off from his knowledge of our where. We, however, are not selfish, and we believe that God is with us through all this blackness and these many dark hours. We shall follow him, and we shall not flinch, even if we peril ourselves that we become like him. Friend John, this has been a great hour, and it hath done much to advance us on our way. You must be scribe and write him all down, so that when the others return from their work, you can give it to them. Then they shall know as much as we do. And so I have written it, whilst we wait their return. And Mrs. Harker has written with the typewriter all since she brought the manuscript to us. Chapter 26 Dr. Seward's Diary 29th of October This is written in the train from Varna to Galatz. Last night we all assembled a little before the time of sunset. Each of us had done his work as well as he could. So far as thought and endeavour and opportunity go, we are prepared for the whole of our journey and for our work when we get to Galatz. When the usual time came round, Mrs. Harker prepared herself for a hypnotic effort, and after a longer and more serious effort on the part of Van Helsing than has usually been necessary, she sank into trance. Usually she speaks on a hint, but this time the professor had to ask her questions, and to ask them pretty resolutely before we could learn anything. At last her answer came. I can see nothing. We are still. There are no waves lapping, but only a steady swirl of water softly running against the hawser. I can hear men's voices calling, near and far, and the rolling creak of oars in the rollocks. A gun is fired somewhere, the echo of it seems far away. There, there's a tramping of feet overhead, and ropes and chains are dragged along. What is this? There's a gleam of light. I can feel the air blowing upon me. Here she stopped. She had risen as if impulsively from where she lay on the sofa, and raised both her hands, palms upwards, as if lifting a weight. Van Helsing and I looked at each other with understanding. Quincy raised his eyebrows slightly and looked at her intently while Harker's hand instinctively closed round the hilt of his cookery. There was a long pause. We all knew that the time when she could speak was passing, but we felt that it was useless to say anything. Suddenly she sat up, and as she opened her eyes said sweetly, Would none of you like a cup of tea? You must all be so tired. We could only make her happy and so acquiesced. She bustled off to get tea. When she had gone, Van Helsing said, You see, my friends, he is close to land. He has left his earth's chest, but he has yet to get to shore. In the night he may lie hidden somewhere, but if he be not carried on shore, or if the ship do not touch it, he cannot achieve the land. In such case he can, if it be in the night, change his form and jump or fly on shore. Then, unless he be carried, he cannot escape, and if he be carried, then the customs men may discover what the box contain. Thus, in fine, if he escape not on shore tonight, or before dawn, there will be the whole day lost to him. We may then arrive in time. Or if he escape not at night, we shall come on him in daytime, boxed up and at our mercy, for he dare not be his true self, awake and visible, lest he be discovered. There was no more to be said, and so we waited in patience until the dawn, at which time we might learn more from Mrs. Harker. Early this morning we listened with breathless anxiety for her response in her trance. The hypnotic stage was even longer in coming than before, and when it came, 
The time remaining until full sunrise was so short that we began to despair. Van Helsing seemed to throw his whole soul into the effort. At last, in obedience to his will, she made reply. All is dark. I hear lapping water level with me, and uh, some creaking as of wood on wood. She paused, and the red sun shot up. We must wait till tonight. And so it is that we are travelling towards Galatz in an agony of expectation. We are due to arrive between two and three in the morning, but already at Bucharest we are three hours late, so we cannot possibly get in till well after sun-up. Thus we shall have two more hypnotic messages from Mrs. Harker. Either or both may possibly throw more light on what is happening. Later, sunset has come and gone. Fortunately, it came at a time when there was no distraction, for had it occurred whilst we were at a station, we might not have secured the necessary calm and isolation. Mrs. Harker yielded to the hypnotic influences even less readily than this morning. I am in fear that her power of reading the Count's sensation may die away, just when we want it most. It seems to me that her imagination is beginning to work. Whilst she has been in the trance hitherto, she has confined herself to the simplest of facts. If this goes on, it may ultimately mislead us. If I thought that the Count's power over her would die away equally with her power of knowledge, it would be a happy thought. But I am afraid that it may not be so. When she did speak, her words were enigmatical. Something's going out. I can feel it pass me like a cold wind. I can hear far off, confused sounds, as if men talking in strange tongues, fierce falling water, and the howling of wolves. She stopped, and a shudder ran through her, increasing in intensity for a few seconds, till, at the end, she shook as though in a palsy. She said no more, even in answer to the professor's imperative questioning. When she woke from the trance, she was cold and exhausted and languid, but her mind was all alert. She couldn't remember anything, but asked what she had said. When she was told, she pondered over it deeply for a long time, and in silence. 30th of October, 7 a.m. We are near Galatz now, and I may not have time to write later. Sunrise this morning was anxiously looked for by us all. Knowing of the increasing difficulty of procuring the hypnotic trance, Van Helsing began his passes earlier than usual. They produced no effect, however, until the regular time, when she yielded with a still greater difficulty, only a minute before the sun rose. The professor lost no time in his questioning. Her answer came back with equal quickness. All is dark. I hear water swirling by, level with my ears, and the creaking of wood on wood. Cattle, low, far off. There's another sound, a queer one, like she stopped and grew white, and whiter still. Go on, speak, I command you, said Van Helsing in an agonized voice. At the same time there was despair in his eyes, for the risen sun was reddening even Mrs. Harker's pale face. She opened her eyes, and we all started as she said, sweetly and seemingly with the utmost unconcern. Oh, Professor, why ask me to do what you know I can't? I don't remember anything. Then, seeing the look of amazement on our faces, she said, turning from one to the other with a troubled look, What have I said? What have I done? I know nothing, only that I was lying here, half asleep, and heard you say, Go on, speak, I command you. It seems so funny to hear you order me about as if I were a bad child. Oh, Madame Mina, he said sadly, it is proof, if proof be needed, of how I love and honour you, when a word for your good, spoken more earnest than ever, can seem so strange, because it is to order her, whom I am proud to obey. The whistles are sounding. We're nearing Galatz. We're on fire with anxiety and eagerness. Mina Harker's journal. 30th of October. Mr. Morris took me to the hotel where our rooms have been ordered by telegraph, he being the one who could best be spared, since he doesn't speak any foreign language. The forces were distributed much as they had been at Varna, except that Lord Godalming went to the vice-consul. 
as his rank might serve as an immediate guarantee of some sort to the official, we being in extreme hurry. Jonathan and the two doctors went to the shipping agent to learn particulars of the arrival of the Tsarina Catherine. Later. Lord Godalming has returned. The consul is away and the vice consul sick, so the routine work has been attended to by a clerk. He was very obliging and offered to do anything in his power. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 30th of October. At nine o'clock, Dr. Van Helsing, Dr. Seward and I called in Messrs. Mackenzie and Steinkoff, the agents of the London firm of Hapgood. They had received a wire from London in answer to Lord Godalming's telegraphed request, asking them to show us any civility in their power. They were more than kind and courteous, and took us at once on board the Tsarina Catherine, which lay at anchor out in the river harbour. There we saw the captain, Donaldson by name, who told us of his voyage. He said that in all his life he had never had so favourable a run. Man, he said, but I made us afeard, for we expected that we should have to pay for it with some rare piece of ill luck, so as to keep up the average. It's no canny to run frae London to the Black Sea where wind to hint ye, as though the deal his sail were blowing on your sail for his ain purpose. And all the time we could no spear a thing, gain we were nae a ship, or a port, or a headland. A fog fell on us and travelled wi' us, till when after it had lifted and we looked out, the deal a thing could we see. We ran by Gibraltar without being able to signal, until we came to the Dardanelles and had to wait to get our permit to pass. We were never within hail of aught. At first I inclined to slack off sail and beat about till the fog was lifted. But whiles I thought that if the deal was minded to get us into the Black Sea quick, he was like to day it, whether we would or no. If we had a quick voyage, it would no be to our miscredit with the owners, or no hurt to our traffic, and the old man who had served his ain purpose would be decently grateful to us for no hindering him. The mixture of simplicity and cunning, of superstition and commercial reasoning roused Van Helsing, who said, Mein friend, that devil is more clever than he is thought by some, and he know when he met his match. The skipper was not displeased with the compliment and went on. When we got past the Bosphorus, the men began to grumble. Some of them, the Romanians, came and asked me to heave overboard the big box which had been put on board by a queer-looking old man, just afore we had started for London. I had seen them spear at the fellow and put out their twa fingers when they saw him to guard them against the evil eye. Man, but the superstition of foreigners is perfectly ridiculous. I sent them about their business pretty quick, but it's just after a fog closed in on us, I felt a wee bit as they did in it something, though I wouldn't say it was again the big box. Well, on we went, and as the fog didn't let up for five days, I just let the wind carry us, for if the deal wanted to get somewheres, well, he would fetch it up or eat. And if he didn't, well, we'd keep a sharp lookout anyhow. Sure enough, we had a fair way in deep water all the time, and two days ago, when the morning sun came through the fog, we found ourselves just in the river opposite Galatz. The Romanians were wild, and wanted me right or wrong to take out the box and fling it in the river. I had to argue with him about it with a handspike, and when the last of them rose off the deck with his head on his hand, I had convinced them that, evil eye, or no evil eye, the property and the trust of my owners were better in my hands than in the river Danube. They had, mind ye, taken the box on the deck ready to fling in, and as it was marked Galatz via Varna, I thought I'd let it lie till we discharged in the port and get rid of it altogether. We didn't do much clearing that day and had to remain the nicht at anchor, but in the morning, Braw and early, an hour before sun-up, a man come aboard with an order written to him for England to receive a box marked for one Count Dracula. Sure enough, the matter was on ready to his hand. He had his papers all right, and glad I was to be rid of the damn thing, for I was beginning myself to feel uneasy at it. If the deal did have any luggage aboard the ship, I'm thinking. It was nae neither than that same. 
What was the name of the man who took it? asked Dr. Van Helsing with restrained eagerness. I'll be telling you quick, he answered, and stepping down into his cabin, produced a receipt signed Emanuel Hildesheim. Bergenstrasse 16 was the address. We found out that this was all the captain knew, so with thanks we came away. We found Hildesheim in his office, a Hebrew of rather the Adelphi theatre type, with a nose like a sheep and a fez. His arguments were pointed with Spacey, we doing the punctuation, and with a little bargaining he told us what he knew. This turned out to be simple, but important. He had received a letter from Mr. Deville of London telling him to receive, if possible before sunrise, so as to avoid customs, a box which would arrive at Galatz in the Tsarina Catherine. This he was to give in charge to a certain Petrov Skinsky, who dealt with the Slovaks who traded down the river to the port. He had been paid for his work by an English banknote, which had been duly cashed for gold at the Danube International Bank. When Skinsky had come to him, he had taken him to the ship and handed over the box, so as to save parterage. That was all he knew. We then sought for Skinsky, but were unable to find him. One of his neighbours, who didn't seem to bear him any affection, said that he had gone away two days before, no one knew whither. This was corroborated by his landlord, who had received by messenger the key of the house together with the rent due in English money. This had been between ten and eleven o'clock last night. We were at a standstill again. Whilst we were talking, one came running and breathlessly gasped out that the body of Skinsky had been found inside the wall of the churchyard of St. Peter, and that the throat had been torn open as if by some wild animal. Those we had been speaking with ran off to see the horror, the women crying out, This is the work of a Slovak! We hurried away lest we should have been in some way drawn into the affair and so detained. As we came home, we could arrive at no definite conclusion. We were all convinced that the box was on its way, by water, to somewhere. But where that might be, we would have to discover. With heavy hearts we came home to the hotel to Mina. When we met together, the first thing was to consult as to taking Mina again into our confidence. Things are getting desperate, and it is at least a chance, though a hazardous one. As a preliminary step, I was released from my promise to her. Mina Harker's Journal 30th of October, Evening They were so tired and worn out and dispirited that there was nothing to be done till they'd had some rest, so I asked them all to lie down for half an hour whilst I should enter everything up to the moment. I feel so grateful to the man who invented the traveller's typewriter and to Mr. Morris for getting this one for me. I should have felt quite astray during the work if I had to write with a pen. It is all done. Poor dear Jonathan. What he must have suffered. What he must be suffering now. He lies on the sofa, hardly seeming to breathe, and his whole body appears in collapse. His brows are knit. His face is drawn with pain. Poor fellow. Maybe he's thinking, and I can see his face all wrinkled up with the concentration of his thoughts. Oh, if I could only help at all. I shall do what I can. I have asked Dr. Van Helsing, and he has got me all the papers that I have not yet seen. Whilst they are resting, I shall go over all carefully. And perhaps I may arrive at some conclusion. I shall try to follow the professor's example and think without prejudice on the facts before me. I do believe that under God's providence I have made a discovery. I shall get the maps and look over them. I am more than ever sure that I am right. My new conclusion is ready, so I shall get out our party together and read it. They can judge it. It is as well to be accurate, and every minute is precious. Mina Harker's memorandum entered in her journal. Ground of inquiry. Count Dracula's problem is to get back to his own place. A. He must be brought back by someone. This is evident. For had he power to move himself as he wished, he could go either as man or wolf or bat or in some other way. He evidently fears discovery or interference. In the state of helplessness, in which he must be confined as he is between dawn and sunset in his wooden box, B. How is he to be taken? Here a process of exclusions may help us.
by road, by rail, by water. 1. By road. There are endless difficulties, especially in leaving the city. X. There are people, and people are curious, and investigate. A hint, a surmise, a doubt as to what might be in the box would destroy him. Y. There are, or there may be, customs and octroi offices to pass. Z. His pursuers might follow. This is his highest fear, and in order to prevent his being betrayed, he is repelled so far as he can, even his victim, me. 2. By rail. There is no one in charge of the box. It would have to take its chance of being delayed, and delay would be fatal with enemies on the track. True, he might escape at night, but what would he be if left in a strange place with no refuge that he could fly to? This is not what he intends, and he does not mean to risk it. By water. Here is the safest way in one respect, but with most danger in another. On the water, he is powerless except at night, and even then he can only summon fog and storm and snow and his wolves. But were he wrecked, the living water would engulf him, helpless, and he would indeed be lost. He could have the vessel drive to land, but if it were unfriendly land wherein he was not free to move, his position would still be desperate. We know from the record that he was on the water, so what we have to ascertain is what water. The first thing is to realise exactly what he has done as yet. We may then get a light on what his task is to be. Firstly, we must differentiate between what he did in London as part of his general plan of action, when he was pressed for moments and had to arrange as best he could. Secondly, we must see, as well as we can surmise it from the facts we know of, what he has done here. As to the first, he evidently intended to arrive at Galatz and sent envoys to Varna to deceive us lest we should ascertain his means of exit from England. His immediate and sole purpose then was to escape. The proof of this is the letter of instructions sent to Emanuel Hildesheim to clear and take away the box before sunrise. There is also the instruction to Petrov Skinsky. These we must only guess at, but there must have been some letter or message since Skinsky came to Hildesheim. That so far his plans were successful, we know, that Tsarina Catherine made a phenomenally quick journey, so much so that Captain Donaldson's suspicions were aroused. But his superstition, united with his canniness, played the Count's game for him, and he ran with his favouring wind through fogs and all, till he brought up blindfolded Galatz. That the Count's arrangements were well made has been proved. Hildesheim cleared the box, took it off, and gave it to Skinsky. Skinsky took it, and here we lose the trail. We only know that the box is somewhere on the water moving along. The customs and the octroi, if there be any, have been avoided. Now we come to what the Count must have done after his arrival on land at Galatz. The box was given to Skinsky before sunrise. At sunrise, the Count could appear in his own form. Here we ask why Skinsky was chosen at all to aid in the work. In my husband's diary, Skinsky is mentioned as dealing with the Slovaks who trade down the river to the port, and the man's remark that the murder was the work of a Slovak showed the general feeling against his class. The Count wanted isolation. My surmise is this, that in London the Count decided to get back to his castle by water as the most safe and secret way. He was brought from the castle by Sagani, and probably they delivered their cargo to Slovaks, who took the boxes to Varna, for there they were shipped to London. Thus the Count had knowledge of the persons who could arrange this service. When the box was on land, before sunrise or after sunset, he came out from his box, met Skinsky, and instructed him what to do as arranging for the carriage of the box up some river. When this was done, and he knew that all was in train, he blotted out his traces, as he thought, by murdering his agent. I have examined the map and find that the river most suitable for the Slovaks to ascend it is either the Pruth or the Serre. I read in the typescript that in my trance I heard cows low and water swirling level with my ears and the creaking of wood. The Count, then, in his box, was on a river in an open boat, propelled probably either by oars or poles, for the banks are near and it is working against stream. There will be no such if floating downstream. Of course, it may not be either the Sereth or the Pruth, but we may possibly investigate further. Now, of these two, 
The proof is the more easily navigated, but the Sereth is, at Fundu, joined by the Bistritza, which runs up round the Borgo Pass. The loop it makes is manifestly as close to Dracula's castle as can be got by water. Mina Harker's journal continued. When I had done reading, Jonathan took me in his arms and kissed me. The others kept shaking me by both hands, and Dr. Van Helsing said, Our dear Madame Mina is once more our teacher. Her eyes have been where we were blinded. Now we are on the track once again, and this time we may succeed. Our enemy is at his most helpless, and if we can come on him by day on the water, our task will be over. He has a start, but he is powerless to hasten, as he may not leave this box lest those who carry him may suspect. For them to suspect would be to prompt them to throw him in the stream where he perish. This he knows and will not. Now, men, to our council of war, for here and now we must plan what each and all shall do. I shall get a steam launch and follow him, said Lord Godalming. And I horses to follow on the bank, lest by chance he land, said Mr. Morris. Good, said the professor, both good, but neither must go alone. There must be force to overcome force if need be. The Slovak is strong and rough, and he carries rude arms. All the men smiled, for amongst them they carried a small arsenal. Said Mr. Morris, I have brought some Winchesters. They are pretty handy in a crowd, and there may be wolves. The Count, if you remember, took some other precautions. He made some requisitions on others that Mrs. Harker couldn't quite hear or understand. We must be ready at all points. Dr. Seward said, I think I had better go with Quincy. We have been accustomed to hunt together, and we too, well armed, will be a match for whatever may come along. You must not be alone, Art, and it may be necessary to fight the Slovaks, and a chance thrust, for I don't suppose these fellows carry guns, would undo all our plans. There must be no chances this time. We shall not rest until the Count's head and body have been separated, and we are sure that he cannot reincarnate. He looked at Jonathan as he spoke, and Jonathan looked at me. I could see that the poor dear was torn about in his mind. Of course, he wanted to be with me. But then the boat service would most likely be the one which would destroy the... the vampire. Why did I hesitate to write the word? He was silent a while, and during his silence Dr. Van Helsing spoke. Friends, Jonathan, this is to you for twice reasons. First, because you are young and brave and can fight, and all energies may be needed at the last. And again, that it is your right to destroy him. That which has wrought such woe to you and yours. Be not afraid for Madame Mina. She will be in my care, if I may. I am old. My legs are not so quick to run as once. And I am not used to ride so long or to pursue as need be or to fight with lethal weapons. But I can be of other service. I can fight in another way, and I can die, if need be, as well as younger men. Now, let me say that what I would is this. While you, my Lord Godalming, and friend Jonathan, go in your so swift little steamboat up the river, and whilst John and Quincy guard the bank where perchance he might be landed, I will take Madame Mina right into the heart of the enemy's country. Whilst the old fox is tied in his box, floating on the running stream, whence he cannot escape to land, where he dares not raise the lid of his coffin box, lest his Slovak carriers should in fear leave him to perish, we shall go in the track where Jonathan went, from the streets over the Borgo and find our way to the castle of Dracula. Here Madame Mina's hypnotic power will surely help, and we shall find our way, all dark and unknown as a vice, after the first sunrise, when we are near that fateful place. There is much to be done, and other places to be made sanctify, so that that nest of vipers be obliterated. Here Jonathan interrupted him hotly. Do you mean to say, Professor Van Helsing, that you would bring Mina, in her sad case, and tainted as she is with that devil's illness, right into the jaws of his death trap? Not for the world, not for heaven or hell. 
He became almost speechless for a minute and then went on. Do you know what that place is? Have you seen that awful den of hellish infamy with the very moonlight alive with grisly shapes and every speck of dust that whirls in the wind a devouring monster in embryo? Have you felt the vampire's lips upon your throat? Here he turned to me, and as his eyes lit on my forehead, he threw up his arms with a cry, Oh my God, what have we done to have this terror upon us? And he sank down on the sofa in a collapse of misery. The professor's voice as he spoke in clear, sweet tones, which seemed to vibrate in the air, calmed us all. Oh, my friend, it is because I would save Madame Mina from that awful place that I would go. God forbids that I should take her into that place. There is work, wild work, to be done before that place can be purified. Remember that we are in terrible straits. If the Count escape us this time, and he is strong and subtle and cunning, he may choose to sleep him for a century, and then in time our dear one, he took my hand, would come to him to keep him company, and would be as those others that you, Jonathan, saw. You have told us of their gloating lips. You heard their ribald laugh as they clutched the moving bags that the Count threw to them. You shudder, and well may it be. Forgive me that I make you so much pain. But it is necessary. My friend, is it not a dire need for that which I am giving possibly my life? If it were that anyone went into that place to stay, it is I who would have to go to keep them company. Do as you will, said Jonathan with a sob that shook him all over. We are in the hands of God. Later, oh, it did me good to see the way that these brave men worked. How can a woman help loving men when they are so earnest and so true and so brave? And two, it made me think of the wonderful power of money. What can it not do when basely used? I felt so thankful that Lord Godalming is rich, and both he and Mr. Morris, who also has plenty of money, are willing to spend it so freely. For if they did not, our little expedition could not start, either so promptly or so well equipped, as it will within another hour. Is it not three hours since it was arranged what part each of us was to do? And now Lord Godalming and Jonathan have a lovely steam launch, with steam up ready to start at a moment's notice. Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris have half a dozen good horses well appointed. We have all the maps and appliances of various kinds that can be had. Professor Van Helsing and I are to leave by the 11.40 train tonight for Veresti, where we are to get a carriage to drive to the Borgo Pass. We are bringing a good deal of ready money, as we are to buy a carriage and horses. We shall drive ourselves, for we have no one whom we can trust in the matter. The professor knows something of a great many languages, so we shall get on all right. We have all got arms, even for me a large bore revolver. Jonathan would not be happy unless I was armed like the rest. Alas, I cannot carry one arm that the rest do. The scar on my forehead forbids that. Dear Dr. Van Helsing comforts me by telling me that I am fully armed, as there may be wolves. The weather is getting colder every hour, and there are snow flurries which come and go as warnings. Later. It took all my courage to say goodbye to my darling. We may never meet again. Courage, Mina. The professor is looking at you keenly. His look is a warning. There must be no tears now, unless it may be that God will let them fall in gladness. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 30th of October, night. I am writing this in the light from the furnace door of the steam launch. Lord Godalming is firing up. He's an experienced hand at the work as he had for years a launch of his own on the Thames and another on the Norfolk Broads. Regarding our plans, we finally decided that Mina's guess was correct and that if any waterway was chosen for the Count's escape back to his castle, the Sereth, and then the Bistritza at its junction would be the one. We took it that somewhere about the 47th degree north latitude would be the place chosen for the crossing of the country between the river and the Carpathians. We have no fear in running at good speed up the river at night. There is plenty of water, and the banks are wide enough apart to make steaming, even in the dark, easy enough. 
Lord Godalming tells me to sleep for a while, as it is enough for the present for one to be on watch. But I cannot sleep. How can I with the terrible danger hanging over my darling, and her going out into that awful place? My only comfort is that we are in the hands of God. Only for that faith it would be easier to die than live, and so be quit of all the trouble. Mr. Morris and Dr. Seward were off on their long ride before we started. They are to keep to the right bank, far enough off to get on higher lands where they can see a good stretch of the river and avoid following its curves. They have for the first stages two men to ride and lead their spare horses, four in all, so as not to excite curiosity. When they dismiss the men, which shall be shortly, they shall themselves look after the horses. It may be necessary for us to join forces. If so, they can mount our whole party. One of the saddles has a movable horn and can be easily adapted for Mina, if required. It is a wild adventure we are on. Here, as we are rushing along through the darkness, with the cold from the river seeming to rise up and strike us, with all the mysterious voices of the night around us, it all comes home. We seem to be drifting into unknown places and unknown ways. Into a whole world of dark and dreadful things, Godalming is shutting the furnace door. 31st October. Still hurrying along, the day has come and Godalming is sleeping. I am on watch. The morning is bitterly cold. The furnace heat is grateful, though we have heavy fur coats. As yet we have passed only a few open boats, but none of them had on board any box or package of anything like the size of the one we seek. The men were scared every time we turned our electric lamp on them and fell on their knees and prayed. 1st November, evening. No news all day. We have found nothing of the kind we seek. We have now passed into the Bistritza, and if we are wrong in our surmise, our chance is gone. We have overhauled every boat, big and little. Early this morning, one crew took us for a government boat and treated us accordingly. We saw in this a way of smoothing matters, so at Fundu, where the Bistritza runs into the Sereth, we got a Romanian flag, which we now fly conspicuously. With every boat which we have overhauled since then, this trick has succeeded. We have had every deference shown to us, and not once any objection to whatever we chose to ask or do. Some of the Slovaks tell us that a big boat passed them, going at more than usual speed as she had a double crew on board. This was before they came to Fundu, so they could not tell us whether the boat turned into the Bistritza or continued on up the Sereth. At Fundu, we could not hear of any such boat, so she must have passed there in the night. I am feeling very sleepy. The cold is perhaps beginning to tell on me, and nature must have rest sometime. Godalming insists that he shall keep the first watch. God bless him for his goodness to poor dear Mina and me. 2nd November, morning. It is broad daylight. That good fellow would not wake me. He says it would have been a sin to, for I slept peacefully and was forgetting my trouble. It seems brutally selfish to me that to have slept so long and to let him watch all night. But he was quite right. I'm a new man this morning. And as I sit here and watch him sleeping, I can do all that is necessary, both as to mind the engine, steering, and keeping watch. I can feel that my strength and energy are coming back to me. I wonder where Mina is now, and Van Helsing. They should have got to Veresti about noon on Wednesday. It would then take them some time to get the carriage and horses. So, if they had started and travelled hard, they would be about now at the Borgo Pass. God guide and help them. I am afraid to think what may happen. If we could only go faster. But we cannot. The engines are throbbing and doing their utmost. I wonder how Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris are getting on. There seem to be endless streams running down the mountains into this river. But as none of them are very large at present at all events, though they are doubtless terrible in winter and when the snow melts, the horsemen may not have met much obstruction. I hope that before we get to Strasbourg we may see them, for if by that time we have not overtaken the Count, it may be necessary to take counsel together what to do next. Dr. Seward's Diary, 2nd of November Three days on the road, no news, and no time to write it if there had been. 
for every moment is precious. We have had only the rest needful for the horses, but we are both bearing it wonderfully. Those adventurous days of ours are turning up useful. We must push on. We shall never feel happy till we get the launch in sight again. 3rd of November. We heard at Fundu that the launch had gone up the Bistritza. I wish it wasn't so cold. There are signs of snow coming. And if it falls heavy, it will stop us. In such case, we must get a sledge and go on Russian fashion. 4th November. Today, we heard of the launch having been detained by an accident when trying to force a way up the rapids. The Slovak boats get up all right by aid of a rope and steering with knowledge. Some went up only a few hours before. Godalming is an amateur fitter himself, and evidently it was he who put the launch in trim again. Finally, they got up the rapids all right, with local help, and are off on the chase afresh. I fear that the boat is not any better for the accident. The peasantry tell us that after she got upon smooth water again, she kept stopping every now and again so long as she was in sight. We must push on harder than ever. Our help may be wanted soon. Mina Harker's Journal, 31st of October Arrived at Veresti at noon, the professor tells me that this morning at dawn he could hardly hypnotize me at all, and that all I could say was dark and quiet. He is off now buying a carriage and horses. He says that he will later on try to buy additional horses so that we may be able to change them on the way. We have something more than seventy miles before us. The country is lovely and most interesting. If only we were under different conditions, how delightful it would be to see it all. If Jonathan and I were driving through it alone, what pleasure it would be to stop and see people and learn something of their life and to fill our minds and memories with all the colour and picturesqueness of the whole wild, beautiful country and the quaint people. But alas! Later, Dr. Van Helsing has returned. He has got the carriage and horses. We are to have some dinner and to start in an hour. The landlady is putting us up a huge basket of provisions. It seems enough for a company of soldiers. The professor encourages her and whispers to me that it may be a week before we can get any food again. He has been shopping too, and has sent home such a wonderful lot of fur coats and wraps and all sorts of warm things. There will not be any chance of our being cold. We shall soon be off. I am afraid to think what may happen to us. We are truly in the hands of God. He alone knows what may be, and I pray to him with all the strength of my sad and humble soul, that he will watch over my beloved husband, that whatever may happen, Jonathan may know that I loved him and honoured him more than I can say, and that my latest and truest thought will be always for him. Chapter 27 Mina Harker's Journal 1st of November All day long we have travelled, and at a good speed. The horses seem to know that they are being kindly treated, for they go willingly their full stage at best speed. We have now had so many changes, and find the same thing so constantly that we are encouraged to think that the journey will be an easy one. Dr. Van Helsing is laconic. He tells the farmers that he is hurrying to Bistritz, and pays them well to make the exchange of horses. We get hot soup, or coffee, or tea, and off we go. It is a lovely country, full of beauties of all imaginable kinds, and the people are brave and strong and simple, and seem full of nice qualities. They are very, very superstitious. In the first house where we stopped, when the woman who served us saw the scar on my forehead, she crossed herself and put out two fingers towards me to keep off the evil eye. I believe they went to the trouble of putting an extra amount of garlic into our food, and I can't abide garlic. Ever since then, I have taken care not to take off my hat or veil, and so have escaped their suspicions. We are travelling fast, and as we have no driver with us to carry tales, we go ahead of scandal. But I dare say that fear of the evil eye will follow hard behind us all the way. The professor seems tireless. All day he would not take any rest, though he made me sleep for a long spell. At sunset time he hypnotized me, and he says I answered as usual, darkness, lapping water, and creaking wood. So, our enemy is still on the river. I am afraid to think of Jonathan. 
but somehow I have now no fear for him, or for myself. I write this whilst we wait in a farmhouse for the horses to be ready. Dr. Van Helsing is sleeping. Poor dear, he looks very tired, and old, and grey, but his mouth is set as firmly as a conqueror's. Even in his sleep he is intense with resolution. When we have well started, I must make him rest whilst I drive. I shall tell him that we have days before us, and he must not break down when most of all his strength will be needed. All is ready. We are off shortly. 2nd of November morning. I was successful, and we took turns driving all night. Now the day is on us, bright though cold. There is a strange heaviness in the air. I say heaviness for want of a better word. I mean that it oppresses us both. It is very cold, and only our warm furs keep us comfortable. At dawn Van Helsing hypnotized me. He says I answered, Darkness, creaking wood, and roaring water. So the river is changing as they ascend. I do hope that my darling will not run any chance of danger more than need be, but we are in God's hands. 2nd of November, night. All day long driving. The country gets wilder as we go, and the great spurs of the Carpathians, which at Veresti seemed so far from us and so low on the horizon, now seem to gather round us and tower in front. We both seem in good spirits, I think we make an effort each to cheer the other. In the doing so, we cheer ourselves. Dr. Van Helsing says that by morning we shall reach the Borgo Pass. The houses are very few here now, and the professor says that the last horse we got will have to go on with us, as we may not be able to change. He got two in addition to the two we changed, so that now we have a rude four in hand. The dear horses are patient and good, and they give us no trouble. We are not worried with other travellers, and so even I can drive. We shall get to the pass in daylight. We do not want to arrive before, so we take it easy, and have each a long rest in turn. Oh, what will tomorrow bring us? We go to seek the place where my poor darling suffered so much. God grant that we may be guided aright, and that he will deign to watch over my husband and those dear to us both, and who are in such deadly peril. As for me, I am not worthy in his sight, alas, I am unclean to his eyes, and shall be, until he may deign to let me stand forth in his sight as one of those who have not incurred his wrath. Memorandum by Abraham Van Helsing. 4th November. This to my old and true friend John Stewart, MD of Purfleet, London, in case I may not see him. It may explain. It is morning, and I write by a fire which all the night I have kept alive, Madame Mina aiding me. It is cold, cold, so cold that the grey, heavy sky is full of snow which when it falls will settle for all winter, as the ground is hardening to receive it. It seems to have affected Madame Mina. She has been so heavy of head all day that she was not like herself. She sleeps and sleeps and sleeps. She, who is usual so alert, have done literally nothing all the day. She even have lost her appetite. She make no entry into her little diary, she who writes so faithful at every pause. Something whisper to me that all is not well. However, tonight she is more vif. A long sleep all day have refresh and restore her, for now she is all sweet and bright as ever. At sunset I try to hypnotize her, but alas, with no effect. The power has grown less and less with each day, and tonight it fail me altogether. Well, God's will be done, whatever it may be, and whithersoever it may lead. Now to the historical. 
For as Madame Mina write not in her stenography, I must in my cumbrous old fashion, that so each day of us may not go unrecorded. We got to the Borgo Pass just after sunrise yesterday morning. When I saw the signs of the dawn, I got ready for the hypnotism. We stopped our carriage and got down so that there might be no disturbance. I made a couch with furs, and Madame Mina, lying down, yielded herself, as usual, but more slow and more short time than ever to the hypnotic sleep. As before came the answer, darkness and the swirling of water. Then she woke bright and radiant, and we go on our way and soon reach the pass. At this time and place, she become all on fire with zeal. Some new guiding power be in her manifested, for she point to a road and say, This, this is the way. How know you it, I ask? Of course I know it, she answer, and this a pause at, Have not my Jonathan travelled it and wrote of his travel? At first I think somewhat strange, but soon I see that there be only one such by road. It is used but little, and very different from the coach road from the Bukovina to Bistritz, which is more wide at heart and more of use. So we came down this road. When we meet other ways, not always were we sure that they were roads at all, for they be neglect and light snow have fallen. The horses know, and they only. I give rein to them, and they go on so patient. By and by, we find all the things which Jonathan have noted in that wonderful diary of him. Then we go on for long, long hours and hours. At the first I tell Madame Mina to sleep. She try, and she succeed. She sleep all the time, till at the last I feel myself to suspicious grow, and attempt to wake her. But she sleep on, and I may not wake her, so I try. I do not wish to try too hard, lest I harm her, for I know that she have suffered much, and sleep at times be all in all to her. I think I drowse myself, for all of a sudden I feel guilt, as though I have done something. I find myself bolt up, with the reins in my hand, and the good horses go along, jog, jog, just as ever. I look down and find Madame Mina still asleep. It is now not far off sunset time, and over the snow the light of the sun flow in big yellow flood, so that we throw great long shadow on where the mountain rise so steep, for we are going up and up, and all is oh so wild and rocky as though it were the end of the world. Then I arouse Madame Mina. This time she wake with not much trouble, and then I try to put her into hypnotic sleep. But she sleep not, being as though I were not. Still I try and try, till all at once I find her and myself in dark. So I look round and find that the sun have gone down. Madame Mina laugh, and I turn and look at her. She is now quite awake, and looks so well as I never saw her since that night at Carfax when we first entered the Count's house. I am amazed and not at ease then, but she is so bright and tender and thoughtful for me, that I forget all fear. I light a fire, for we have brought a supply of wood with us, and she prepare food, while I undo the horses and set them, tethered in shelter to feed. Then, when I return to the fire, she have my supper ready. I go to help her, but she smile, and tell me that she have eat already, that she was so hungry, that she would not wait. I like it not, and I have grave doubts, but I fear to affright her, and so I am silent of it. 
She helped me, and I eat alone. And then we wrap in fur and lie beside the fire, and I tell her to sleep while I watch. But presently, I forget all of watching. And when I suddenly remember that I watch, I find her lying quiet, but awake, and looking at me with so bright eyes. Once, twice more, the same occur, and I get much sleep till before morning. When I wake, I try to hypnotize her, but alas, though she shut her eyes obedient, she may not sleep. The sun rise up and up and up, and then sleep come to her too late, but so heavy that she will not wake. I have to lift her up and place her sleeping in the carriage when I have harnessed the horses and made all ready. Madame still sleep, and she look in her sleep more healthy and more redder than before. And I like it not. And I am afraid, afraid, afraid. I am afraid of all things, even to think, even to think. But I must go on my way. The stake we play for is life and death, or more than these, and we must not flinch. 5th November morning. Let me be accurate in everything. Oh, though you and I have seen some strange things together, you may at the first think that I, Van Helsing, am mad that the many horrors and the so long strain on nerves has at the last turned my brain. All yesterday we travel, always getting closer to the mountains and moving in a more and more wild and desert land. There are great frowning precipices and much falling water, and nature seemed to have held some time her carnival. Madame Mina still sleep and sleep, and though I did have hunger and appeased it, I could not waken her, even for food. I began to fear that the fatal spell of the place was upon her, tainted as she is with that vampire baptism. Well, said I to myself, if it be that she sleep all the day, it shall also be that I do not sleep at night. As we travel on the rough road, for a road of an ancient and imperfect kind there was, I held down my head and slept. Again I waked with a sense of guilt and of time past, and found Madame Mina still sleeping and the sun low down. But all was indeed changed. The frowning mountains seemed farther away, and we were near the top of a steep rising hill, on summit of which was such a castle as Jonathan tell of in his diary. At once I exulted and feared, for now, for good or ill, the end was near. I woke Madame Mina and again tried to hypnotize her, but alas, unavailing till too late, then is a great dark came upon us, for even after down sun the heavens reflected the gone sun on the snow, and all was for a time in a great twilight. I took out the horses and fed them in what shelter I could. Then I make a fire, and near it I make Madame Mina, now awake and more charming than ever, sit comfortable amid her rugs. I got ready food, but she would not eat simply saying that she had not hunger. I did not press her, knowing her unavailingness. But I myself eat, for I must needs now be strong for all. Then, with the fear on me of what might be, I drew a ring so big for her comfort round where Madame Mina sat, and over the ring I passed some of the wafer and I broke it fine, so that all was well guarded. She sat still all the time, so still as one dead. 
and she grew whiter and even whiter till the snow was not more pale, and no words she said. But when I drew near, she clung to me, and I could know that the poor soul shook her from head to feet with a tremor that was pain to feel. I said to her presently, when she had grown more quiet, Will you not come over to the fire? For I wished to make a test of what she could. She rose obedient, but when she had made a step, she stopped and stood as one stricken. Why not go on? I asked. She shook her head and, coming back, sat down in her place. Then, looking at me with open eyes, as of one waked from sleep, she said simply, I cannot, and remained silent. I rejoiced, for I knew that what she could not, none of those that we dreaded could, though there might be danger to her body, yet her soul was safe. Presently the horses began to scream and tore at their tethers till I came to them and quieted them. When they did feel my hands upon them, they whinnied low as in joy and licked at my hands and were quiet for a time. Many times through the night did I come to them, till it arrived to the cold hour when all nature is at lowest, and every time my coming was with quiet of them. In the cold hour, the fire began to die, and I was about stepping forth to replenish it, for now the snow came in flying sweeps and with a chill mist. Even in the dark, there was a light of some kind, as there ever is of a snow, and it seemed as though the snow flurries and the wreaths of mist took shape as of women with trailing garments. All was in dead, grim silence, only that the horses whinnied and cowered as if in terror of the worst. I began to fear, horrible fears, but then came to me the sense of safety in that ring wherein I stood. I began, too, to think that my imaginings were of the night and the gloom and the unrest that I have gone through and all the terrible anxiety. It was as though my memories of all Jonathan's horrid experience were befooling me, for the snow flakes and the mist began to wheel and circle round, till I could get as though a shadowy glimpse of those women that would have kissed him. And then the horses cowered lower and lower, and moaned in terror as men do in pain. Even the madness of fright was not to them, so that they could break away. I feared for my dear Madame Mina when these weird figures drew near and circled round. I looked at her, but she sat calm and smiled at me. When I would have stepped to the fire to replenish it, she caught me and held me back and whispered, like a voice that one hears in a dream, so low it was. No, no, do not go without. Here, you are safe. I turned to her, and looking in her eyes said, But you, it is for you that I fear. Whereat she laughed, a laugh low and unreal, and said, Fear for me? Why fear for me? none safer in all the world from them than I am, and as I wondered at the meaning of her words, a puff of wind made the flame leap up, and I see the red scar on her forehead. Then, alas, I knew. Did I not? I would soon have learnt, for the wheeling figures of mist and snow came closer, but keeping ever without the holy circle. Then they began to materialize, till if God have not taken away my reason, for I saw it through my eyes, they were before me in actual flesh, the same three women that Jonathan saw in the room when they would have kissed his throat. 
I knew the swaying round forms, the bright hard eyes, the white teeth, the ruddy colour, the voluptuous lips. They smiled ever at poor dear Madame Mina, and as their laugh came through the silence of the night, they twined their arms and pointed to her, and said in those so sweet tingling tones that Jonathan said were of the intolerable sweetness of the water glasses, Come, sister, come to us, come. In fear, I turned to my poor Madame Mina, and my heart with gladness leapt like flame. For, oh, the terror in her sweet eyes, the repulsion, the horror, told a story to my heart that was all of hope. God be thanked, she was not yet of them. I seized some of the firewood which was by me, and holding out some of the wafer, advanced on them towards the fire. They drew back before me, and laughed their low, horrid laugh. I fed the fire, and feared them not, for I knew that we were safe within the ring, which she could not leave no more than they could enter. The horses had ceased to moan, and lay still on the ground. The snow fell on them softly, and they grew whiter. I knew that there was for the poor beasts no more of terror. And so we remained till the red of the dawn began to fall through the snow gloom. I was desolate and afraid and full of woe and terror. But when that beautiful sun began to climb the horizon, life was to me again. At the first coming of the dawn, the horrid figures melted into the whirling mist and snow. The wreaths of transparent gloom moved away towards the castle and were lost. Instinctively, with the dawn coming, I turned to Madame Mina, intending to hypnotize her, but she lay in a deep and sudden sleep, from which I could not wake her. I tried to hypnotize through her sleep, but she made no response, none at all, and the day broke. I fear yet to stir. I have made my fire and have seen the horses. They are all dead. Today I have much to do here and I keep waiting till the sun is up high. For there may be places where I must go, where that sunlight, though snow and mist obscure it, will be to me a safety. I will strengthen me with breakfast, and then I will do my terrible work. Madame Mina still sleeps, and God be thanked, she is calm in her sleep. Jonathan Harker's Journal 4th of November, evening. The accident to the launch has been a terrible thing for us. Only for it we should have overtaken the boat long ago, and by now my dear Mina would have been free. I fear to think of her off in the wolds near that horrid place. We have got horses, and we follow on the track. I note this whilst Godalming is getting ready. We have our arms. The Sgarni must look out if they mean to fight. Oh, if only Morris and Seward were with us. We must only hope. If I write no more, goodbye, Mina. God bless and keep you. Dr. Seward's Diary, 5th of November. With the dawn, we saw the body of Sagani before us, dashing away from the river with their lighter wagon. They surrounded it in a cluster and hurried along as though beset. The snow is falling lightly, and there is a strange excitement in the air. It may be our own feelings, but the depression is strange. Far off, I hear the howling of wolves. The snow brings them down from the mountains, and there are dangers to all of us and from all sides. The horses are nearly ready, and we are soon off. We ride to death of someone. God alone knows who, or where, or what, or when, or how it may be. Dr. Van Helsing's Memorandum, 5th November, Afternoon I am at least sane. Thank God for that mercy at all events, though the proving it has been dreadful. When I left Madame Mina sleeping within the holy circle, I took my way to the castle. 
The blacksmith's hammer, which I took in the carriage from Veresti, was useful. Though the doors were all open, I broke them off the rusty hinges, lest some ill intent or ill chance should close them, so that being entered, I might not get out. Jonathan's bitter experience served me here. By memory of his diary, I found my way to the old chapel, for I knew that here my work lay. The air was oppressive. It seemed as if there was some sulfurous fume, which at times made me dizzy. Either there was a roaring in my ears, or I heard afar off the howl of wolves. Then I besought me of my dear Madame Mina, and I was in terrible plight. The dilemma had me between his horns. Her I had not dared to take into this place, but left safe from the vampire in that holy circle. And yet even there would be the wolf. I resolved me that my work lay here, and that as to the wolves we must submit, if it were God's will. At any rate it was only death and freedom beyond. So did I choose for her. Had it been but for myself, the choice had been easy. The maw of the wolf were better to rest in than the grave of the vampire. So I make my choice to go on with my work. I knew that there were at least three graves to find, graves that are in habit. So I search and search, and I find one of them. She lay in her vampire's sleep, so full of life and voluptuous beauty, that I shudder as though I have come to do murder. Ah, I doubt not that in the old time, when such things were, Many a man who set forth to do such a task as mine found at the last his heart fail him, and then his nerve, so he delay and delay and delay, till the mere beauty and the fascination of the wanton undead have hypnotized him, and he remain on and on till sunset come, and the vampire sleep be over. Then the beautiful eyes of the fair woman open and look love and the voluptuous mouse present to a kiss, and the man is weak, and there remain one more victim in the vampire fault, one more to swell the grim and grisly ranks of the undead. There is some fascination surely when I am moved by the mere presence of such a one, even lying as she lay in a tomb fretted with age and heavy with the dust of centuries so there be that horrid odour, such as the lairs of the Count have had. Yes, I was moved. I, Van Helsing, with all my purpose and with my motive for hate, I was moved to a yearning for delay, which seemed to paralyse my faculties and to clog my very soul. It may have been that the need of natural sleep and the strange oppression of the air were beginning to overcome me. Certain it was that I was lapsing into sleep, the open-eyed sleep of one who yields to a sweet fascination, when there came through the snow-stilled air a long, low wail, so full of awe and pity that it woke me like the sound of a clarion, for it was the voice of my dear Madame Mina that I heard. Then I braced myself again to my horrid task, and found by wrenching away tomb tops one other of the sisters, the other dark one. I dared not pause to look on her as I had on her sister, lest once more I should begin to be in thrall. But I go on searching until, presently, I find in a great high tomb, as if made of one much beloved, that other fair sister, which, like Jonathan, I had seen to gather herself, out of the atoms of the mist. She was so fair to look on, so radiantly beautiful, so exquisitely voluptuous, that the very instinct of man in me, which calls some of my sex to love and to protect one of hers, made my head whirl with new emotion. But, God be thanked, that soul veil of my dear Madame Mina had not died out of my ears. 
and before the spell could be wrought further upon me, I had nerved myself to my wild work. By this time, I had searched all the tombs in the chapel so far as I could tell, and as there had been only three of these undead phantoms around us in the night, I took it that there were no more of active undeads existent. There was one great tomb, more lordly than all the rest. Huge it was, and nobly proportioned. On it was but one word, Dracula. This, then, was the undead home of the King Vampire, to whom so many more were due. Its emptiness spoke eloquent to make certain what I knew. Before I began to restore these women to their dead selves through my awful work, I laid in Dracula's tomb some as a wafer, and so banished him from it, undead forever. Then began my terrible task, and I dreaded it. Had it been but one, it had been easy, comparative, but three, to begin twice more after I had been through a deed of horror, for it was terrible with the sweet Miss Lucy, what would it not be with these strange ones? who had survived through centuries, who had been strengthened by the passing of years, who would, if they could, have fought for their foul lives. Oh, my friend John, but it was butcher work. Had I not been nerved by thoughts of other dead, and of the living over whom hung such a pall of fear, I could not have gone on. I tremble and tremble even yet, though till all was over, God be thanked. My nerve did stand. Had I not seen the repose in the first place, and the gladness that stole over it just ere the final dissolution came, a realization that the soul had been won, I could not have gone further with my butchery. I could not have endured the horrid screeching as the stake drove home, the plunging of writhing form and lips of bloody foam. I should have fled in terror and left my work undone. But it is over, and the poor souls, I can pity them now, and weep, as I think of them placid each in her full sleep of death, for a short moment ere fading. For friend John, hardly had my knife severed the head of each, before the whole body began to melt away and crumple into its native dust, as though the death that should have come centuries agone, had at last assert himself, and say at once and loud, I am here. Before I left the castle I saw fixed its entrances that never more can the Count enter there undead. When I stepped into the circle where Madame Mina slept, she woke from her sleep and seeing me, cried out in pain that I had endured too much. Come, she said, come away from this awful place. Let us go to meet my husband, who is, I know, coming towards us. She was looking thin and pale and weak, but her eyes were pure and glowed with fervour. I was glad to see her paleness and her illness, for my mind was full of the fresh horror of that ruddy vampire sleep. And so, with trust and hope, and yet full of fear, we go eastward to meet our friends and him whom Madame Mina tell me that she know are coming to meet us. Mina Harker's Journal, 6th of November It was late in the afternoon when the professor and I took our way towards the east, whence I knew Jonathan was coming. We did not go fast, though the way was steeply downhill, for we had to take heavy rugs and wraps with us, we dared not face the possibility of being left without warmth in the cold and the snow. We had to take some of our provisions too, for we were in a perfect desolation, and so far as we could see through the snowfall, there was not even the sign of habitation. When we had gone about a mile, I was tired with the heavy walking and sat down to rest. Then we looked back and saw where the clear line of Dracula's castle cut the sky for we were so deep under the hill whereon it was set 
that the angle of perspective of the Carpathian Mountains was far below it. We saw it in all its grandeur, perched a thousand feet on the summit of a sheer precipice, and with seemingly a great gap between it and the steep of the adjacent mountain on any side. We could hear the distant howling of wolves. They were far off, but the sound, even though coming muffled through the deadening snowfall, was full of terror. I knew from the way Dr. Van Helsing was searching about that he was trying to seek some strategic point where we would be less exposed in case of attack. The rough roadway still led downwards. We could trace it through the drifted snow. In a little while, the professor signalled to me, so I got up and joined him. He had found a wonderful spot, a sort of natural hollow in a rock, with an entrance like a doorway between two boulders. He took me by the hand and drew me in. See, he said, here you will be in shelter, and if the wolves do come, I can meet them one by one. He brought in our furs and made a snug nest for me, and got out some provisions and forced them upon me, but I couldn't eat. To even try to do so was repulsive to me, and much as I would have liked to please him, I could not bring myself to the attempt. He looked very sad, but didn't reproach me. Taking his field glasses from the case, he stood on the top of the rock and began to search the horizon. Suddenly he called out, Look, Madamina, look, look! I sprang up and stood beside him on the rock. He handed me his glasses and pointed. The snow was now falling more heavily and swirled about fiercely, for a high wind was beginning to blow. However, there were times when there were pauses between the snow flurries, and I could see a long way round. From the height where we were, it was possible to see a great distance, and far off, beyond the white waste of snow, I could see the river lying like a black ribbon in kinks and curls as it wound its ways. Straight in front of us, and not far off, in fact so near that I wondered we hadn't noticed before, came a group of mounted men hurrying along. In the midst of them was a cart, a long lighter wagon which swept from side to side, like a dog's tail wagging with each stern inequality of the road. Outlined against the snow as they were, I could see from the men's clothes that they were peasants or gypsies of some kind. On the cart was a great square chest. My heart leaped as I saw it, for I felt that the end was coming. The evening was now drawing close, and well I knew that at sunset the thing, which was till then imprisoned there, would take a new freedom and could, in any of its many forms, elude pursuit. In fear I turned to the professor. To my consternation, however, he wasn't there. An instant later I saw him below me. Round the rock he had drawn a circle, such as we had found shelter in last night. When he had completed it, he stood beside me again, saying, At least you shall be safe here from him. He took the glasses from me, and at the next lull of the snow swept the whole space below us. See, he said, they come quickly. They are flogging the horses and galloping as hard as they can. He paused and went on in a hollow voice. They are racing for the sunset. We may be too late. God's will be done. Down came another blinding rush of driving snow and the whole landscape was blotted out. It soon passed, however, and once more his glasses were fixed on the plain. Then came a sudden cry, Look, 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 see, two horsemen follow fast, coming up from the south. It must be Quincy and John. Take the glass, look, before the snow blots it all out. I took it and looked. The two men might be Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris. I knew at all events that neither of them was Jonathan. At the same time, I knew that Jonathan wasn't far off. Looking around, I saw on the north side of the coming party two other men riding at breakneck speed. One of them I knew was Jonathan, and the other I took, of course, to be Lord Godalming. They too were pursuing the party with the cart. When I told the professor, he shouted in glee like a schoolboy, and after looking intently till the snowfall made sight impossible, he laid his Winchester rifle ready for use against the boulder of the opening of our shelter. They are all converging, he said. When the time comes, we shall have gypsies on all sides. I got out my revolver ready to hand, for whilst we were speaking, the howling of wolves came louder and closer. When the snowstorm abated a moment, we looked again. It was strange to see the snow falling in such heavy flakes close to us and beyond, 
the sun shining more and more brightly as it sank down towards the far mountain tops. Sweeping the glass all around us, I could see here and there dots moving singly and in twos and threes and larger numbers. The wolves were gathering for their prey. Every instant seemed an age whilst we waited. The wind came now in fierce bursts, and the snow was driven with fury as it swept upon us in circling eddies. At times we couldn't see an arm's length before us, but at others, as the hollow-sounding wind swept by us, it seemed to clear the airspace around us so that we could see afar off. We had of late been so accustomed to watch for sunrise and sunset that we knew with fair accuracy when it would be, and we knew that before long the sun would set. It was hard to believe that by our watches it was less than an hour that we waited in that rocky shelter before the various bodies began to converge close upon us. The wind came now with fiercer and more bitter sweeps, and more steadily from the north. It seemingly had driven the snow clouds from us, for with only occasional bursts the snow fell. We could distinguish clearly the individuals of each party, the pursued and the pursuers. Strangely enough, those pursued did not seem to realise, or at least to care, that they were pursued. They seemed, however, to hasten with redoubled speed as the sun dropped lower and lower on the mountain tops. Closer and closer they drew. The professor and I crouched down behind our rock and held our weapons ready. I could see that he was determined that they should not pass. One and all were quite unaware of our presence. All at once two voices shouted out to halt. One was my Jonathan's raised in a high key of passion, the other Mr. Morris's strong, resolute tone of quiet command. The gypsies may not have known the language, but there was no mistaking the tone in whatever tongue the words were spoken. Instinctively they reined in, and at the instant Lord Godalming and Jonathan dashed up at one side, and Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris on the other. The leader of the gypsies, a splendid-looking fellow who sat on his horse like a centaur waved them back, and in a fierce voice gave these companions some word to proceed. They lashed the horses, which sprang forward, but the four men raised their Winchester rifles and, in an unmistakable way, commanded them to stop. At the same moment, Dr. Van Helsing and I rose behind the rock and pointed our weapons at them. Seeing that they were surrounded, the men tightened their reins and drew up. The leader turned to them and gave a word at which every man of the gypsy party drew what weapon he carried, knife or pistol, and held himself in readiness to attack. Issue was joined in an instant. The leader, with a quick movement of his rein, threw his horse out in front and pointed first to the sun, now close down on the hilltops, and then to the castle, said something which I didn't understand. For answer, all four men of our party threw themselves from their horses and dashed towards the cart. I should have felt a terrible fear at seeing Jonathan in such danger, but that his ardour of battle must have been upon me as well as the rest of them. I felt no fear, but only a wild, surging desire to do something. Seeing the quick movement of our parties, the leader of the gypsies gave a command. His men instantly formed round the cart in a sort of undisciplined endeavour, each one shouldering and pushing the other in his eagerness to carry out the order. In the midst of this, I could see that Jonathan, on one side of the ring of men, and Quincy on the other, were forcing a way to the cart. It was evident that they were bent on finishing their task before the sun should set. Nothing seemed to stop or even to hinder them, neither the levelled weapons nor the flashing knives of the gypsies in front, nor the howling of the wolves behind appeared to even attract their attention. Jonathan's impetuosity and the manifest singleness of his purpose seemed to overawe those in front of him. Instinctively they cowered aside and let him pass. In an instant he had jumped up upon the cart, and with a strength which seemed incredible, raised the great box and flung it over the wheel to the ground. In the meantime Mr. Morris had had to use force to pass through his side of the ring of Sagani. All the time I had been breathlessly watching Jonathan I had, with the tail of my eye, seen him pressing desperately forward, and had seen the knives of the gypsies flash as he won away through them, and they cut at him. He had parried with his great bowie knife, and at first I thought that he too had come through in safety, 
but as he sprang beside Jonathan, who had by now jumped from the cart, I could see that with his left hand he was clutching at his side and that the blood was spurting through his fingers. He did not delay, notwithstanding this, for as Jonathan, with desperate energy, attacked one end of the chest, attempting to prise off the lid with his great cookery knife, he attacked the other frantically with his bowie. Under the efforts of both men, the lid began to yield. The nails drew with a screeching sound, and the top of the box was thrown back. By this time, the gypsies, seeing themselves covered by the Winchesters and at the mercy of Lord Godalming and Dr. Seward, had given in and made no further resistance. The sun was almost down on the mountain tops, and the shadows of the whole group fell upon the snow. I saw the Count lying within the box upon the earth, some of which the rude falling from the cart had scattered over him. He was deathly pale, just like a waxen image, and the red eyes glared with the horrible vindictive look which I knew so well. As I looked, the eyes saw the sinking sun, and the look of hate in them turned to triumph. But on the instant came the sweep and flash of Jonathan's great knife, I shrieked as I saw it shear through the throat, whilst at the same moment Mr. Morris's bowie knife plunged into the heart. It was like a miracle, but before our very eyes, and almost in the drawing of a breath, the whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. I shall be glad as long as I live that even in that moment of final dissolution there was in the face a look of peace, such as I never could have imagined might have rested there. The castle of Dracula now stood out against the red sky, and every stone of its broken battlements was articulated against the light of the setting sun. The gypsies, taking us as in some way the cause of the extraordinary disappearance of the dead man, turned, without a word, and rode away as if for their lives. Those who were unmounted jumped on the lighter wagon and shouted to the horsemen not to desert them. The wolves, which had withdrawn to a safe distance, followed in their wake, leaving us alone. Mr. Morris, who had sunk to the ground, leaned on his elbow, holding his hand pressed to his side. The blood still gushed through his fingers. I flew to him, for the holy circle did not now keep me back. So did the two doctors. Jonathan knelt behind him and the wounded man laid back his head on his shoulder. With a sigh he took, with a feeble effort, my hand in that of his own, which was unstained. He must have seen the anguish of my heart in my face, for he smiled at me and said, I am only too happy to have been of service. Oh God, he cried suddenly, struggling to a sitting posture and pointing to me. It was worth for this to die. Look, look. The sun was now right down upon the mountain top, and the red gleams fell upon my face so that it was bathed in rosy light. With one impulse the men sank on their knees and a deep and earnest Amen broke from all as their eyes followed the pointing of his finger. The dying man spoke. Now God be thanked that all has not been in vain. See! The snow is not more stainless than her forehead. The curse has passed away. And to our bitter grief, with a smile and in silence, he died, a gallant gentleman. Note. Seven years ago, we all went through the flames, and the happiness of some of us since then is, we think, well worth the pain we endured. It is an added joy to Mina and to me that our boy's birthday is the same day as that on which Quincy Morris died. His mother holds, I know, the secret belief that some of our brave friend's spirit has passed into him. His bundle of names links all our little band of men together, but we call him Quincy. In the summer of this year, we made a journey to Transylvania and went over the old ground which was and is to us so full of vivid and terrible memories. It was almost impossible to believe that the things which we had seen with our own eyes and heard with our own ears were living truths. Every trace 
of all that had been was blotted out. The castle stood as before, reared high above a waste of desolation. When we got home, we were talking of the old time, which we could all look back on without despair, for Godalming and Seward are both happily married. I took the papers from the safe where they had been ever since our return long ago. We were struck with the fact that in all the mass of material of which the record is composed, there is hardly one authentic document, nothing but a mass of typewriting, except the later notebooks of Mina and Seward and myself and Van Helsing's memorandum. We could hardly ask anyone, even if we did wish to, to accept these as proofs of so wild a story. Van Helsing summed it all up, as he said, with our boy on his knee. We want no proofs. We ask none to believe us. This boy will some day know what a brave and gallant woman his mother is. Already he knows her sweetness and loving care. Later on, he will understand how some men so loved her that they did dare much for her sake. Jonathan Harker